Call the uh, regular board meeting of Comfort Lake Forest Lake Watershed District to order. First item of business is setting the agenda. Any changes or updates to the agenda? Uh, only, uh, as I mentioned to John yep. through um, email this afternoon, that I have some uh, other documents to hand out. So our discussion on one watershed, one plan will be probably a good half hour, I'm sure. Okay. So we'll add, we'll hand those out at the mm -hmm. 90. At the time, yeah. And then you wanted to remove uh, uh, item B from the consent agenda. Yes. We've got some uh, comments to rework there, so yeah. we'll Correct. take it off mm -hmm. and we'll put it back yeah. through. Anything else? All right, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? I'll move the agenda. With the change? Second change. All right, motion been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We have an agenda. Public comments on the 2020 budget and levy. Does anyone want to make any comments on our budget and levy? Doesn't look like it. All right. We'll move on to the public open forum. Anybody want to make comments about anything else? All right. Citizen Advisory Committee update. Oh, the consent agenda. I walked right by the consent agenda. We at least could vote on the one that's left. <laughs> I'll move uh, item A on the consent agenda. I'll second. Motion been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, now, Citizen Advisory Committee update. Mr. President, managers. Um, the first item I'll note is I think it was mentioned briefly at the last board meeting that at MOD this year there'll be a panel on CACs. Uh, Kurt Sparks from our CAC has um, decided to join on that panel, so he'll be attending MOD. He'll be at the pre-conference as well, and then he'll be on that CAC panel. Um, I think we have another CAC member who is potentially interested, Tom Fury, so he may be there as well. The main topic of discussion at the last CAC meeting was doing kind of initial brainstorms of their 2020 initiatives, and they asked that I pose the question to the board um, if the board had any um, special items they would like the CAC to consider for 2020 initiatives, um, any suggestions, things like that. <laughs> To imagine we don't have an opinion. Um, I didn't have anything prepared for tonight. Does anyone else have any ideas off the top of their head? I, I think just continuing on with the outreach and education uh, focus, that's so important and it, it requires that committee uh, attention, you know, where you can dive into it a little bit deeper and so on. And um, I think we've made really good progress over the last couple of years, so I don't see any reason to not do that. We don't want to overwhelm them. Um, and I think they've got a good structure going. Mm. So, and there's enough, especially with the Jeffers Foundation uh, issue, I think there's enough to keep them busy and, and uh, they, they certainly get informed of the other activities of the board through you or Mike. And, um, and that's important, and they can weigh in and give us their opinions on things as those come up. So okay. I'm, I'm pretty happy with how it's going. Mm -hmm. With that also, I'd like to, um, I just went to an association meeting for Forest Lake ye uh, yesterday, and we're, uh, we're doing a new website, and uh, it, there's gonna be a lot, a lot of education involved with that, right. it's, it's really, easy to get through and it's it's mobile and uh, it has a lot of what we're doing mm -hmm. here Good. it's going to be on it too so that's going to be coming up um in the last part of december so um if you are on the web it's actually going to pop up if you if you just put in like forest lake okay. this will pop up so it'll be right there for you so it should be uh should be a nice education mm -hmm. platform for people. That, uh, Sounds good. Interested. Yeah, good. All right. Anything else? I think the, the only other item I'll note is at the December CAC meeting. I don't believe we have had a board member attend in the fourth quarter um, for CAC. 
Um, so the, the main focus of that will, again, be discussing the 2020 initiatives, but Angie Hong will be there to kind of give her recap on what MREP did and then get the CAC's input on what the CAC would like to see MREP work on and also give them feedback on their initiatives. And that's in December? Correct. Okay. Um, I'll do that one. I was supposed to go to October, but I was in Illinois and didn't make it back uh, in time for that. So I'll just keep my appointment okay. for the fourth quarter. Cool. And then we'll tag someone else in yeah. then we have 2020. Other, mm -hmm. other victim um, members. Yes. <laughs> we can go to the next, uh, the, the, for the next three quarters. All right. Anything else, Jessica? Um, I just received a note from the audience that someone's here to give a comment for the open forum. Oh. We move so fast through it. <laughs> Someone I know. Hey, John. Hey, Steve. Just uh, really a question. Okay. Just state so your I've, name and all that. Yeah, Steve Gedeke. I live on the south side of Second Lake. Um, I came to the previous open forum discussion. What wasn't clear to me was if the watershed district has alignment around what the end goal is. <clears throat> so as a citizen, it wasn't clear to me, are we pursuing water clarity? Are we pursuing the greatest fish population? Are we pursuing the greatest number of water sports activities? How are we balancing those conflicting goals in it? And I would like as a citizen to have a clear statement of this is what we are trying to achieve. This is what we're, where North is. And then we can start talking about the activities that we need to do to make progress in that direction, including what financial resources are required to get there. So I'm, and I'm maybe more informed than my neighbors because I've been to one meeting and most of us have been to zero. Um, so that's my plea, I guess, is to articulate clearly, maybe tonight or as much as possible, what you believe the end is. And then those of us who may agree or disagree have a forum to articulate our point of view and, and get there. And I'll just state that it's, my, my home is on the south side of Second Lake. And uh, the lake was horrible this year, um, visibly horrible outside my deck. Uh, you know, I had guests over who were shocked at how bad, how, how the poor condition of the lake. I've lived here since 1993, and or, I'm sorry, I've lived here since 1991. Um, so, I mean, it's clearly a call for action, and I think the greatest asset we have in this community is the lake, and it's, it drives home values, it drives people coming to town. Um, uh, so, clearly something needs to be done. I'd like to know what it is that you think needs to be done and how we're going to do it. Okay. Do you want to? Have, have you seen our watershed district plan on the website by chance? I know it's you just lo would love to read a yeah that's a hundred page plan, but maybe two hundred. I, I have not, and I I'll take a step. I'm guilty as charged, but I still think it's incumbent upon the the you know the watershed district as an agency to clearly communicate the end vision. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think what helps, I'm not sure that we can pull it up, but, but our district is uh, organized into lake management subregions and or subwatershed districts, basically. And so, yeah, there we go. And so those are our major lakes. Um, just going from the left, it's Comfort, uh, Forest Lake. Um, the green on the, on the right side is, is Bone, and then Little Comfort in the yellow. So those are our four majors. And so you can see how big that area is. And by focusing on each of those lakes, uh, we look at what is degrading the lake. And our primary uh, focus has been phosphorus removal because that is what turns the lakes green. And when that nutrient gets out of balance, it's very quick. And so we've been focusing on phosphorus. Um, three or four of our lakes are um, impaired by the MPCA, and so we're very concerned, of course, about those and making sure Forest Lake was not uh, during our last 10-year plan, so our, our focus there is making sure that it doesn't um, get on that impaired waters list. And so um, being the biggest lake, obviously, uh, that's broken up into three basins as well, and so we're looking at the dynamics of each of those three uh, basins, but I, I think the, for that area, your area, um, the, the main thing that we've been trying to do is educate people on best management practices so that there isn't further degradation to the lake as, as well as looking at those areas that need to be restored and then restoring those. And uh, there's a detailed plan on Forest Lake, um, so you can certainly uh, grab that online. 
and, and look at the specifics, um, but there were targeted locations on each of the lakes that uh, we had to focus on to make sure that the biggest contributors of phosphorus and uh, nutrient degradation were taken care of. Uh, is, it, is it clear that in the case of Forest Lake that phosphorus is the dominant change that occurred with such dramatic effect in the last two years? I, I guess I'd like to see the phosphorus data to show that we hit an inflection point on Forest Lake that caused it to change so dramatically. Um, I'm not sure that it's changed, but go ahead. So Our engineer will answer that specific. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Um, those, those are good questions, and in Forest Lake in particular, and, and I think we've seen even regionally with the really high water years, we get a lot of nutrients from the landscape. So more than we're used to seeing and then combined with some warmer temperatures and, and longer ice off. But I, if I may interrupt for just a second, mm -hmm. so the hypothesis is that it's driven by phosphorus. Yes. And unless there's data to support the claim that it's driven by driven directly by, by phosphorus, I, I think we should be careful about how we use that claim. And I would argue that um, we've had high water years, for example, in previous years of the 28 years I've lived here, and we've never had anything close to what we had this year. So I'm, I'm very focused on causality. You can tell by the language I use that I'm a scientist, and that um, uh, so I'm, I'm just looking at Jackie's claim that it's driven by phosphorus. So if we're going to focus on phosphorus, let's talk about phosphorus. <clears throat> but I would also tell you as a longtime resident as I look around, you know, like how much development there is around the lake and what could potentially be driving phosphorus, there are some things that could be making a difference. There are some things that could not be making a difference, uh, whether it's agriculture or residential use of fertilizers, for example. So I'll just come back to my basic question, being the direct person that I am, it, it, do we know that the phosphorus is worse in the last two years than it was in the previous 26? The phosphorus levels were not significantly higher in the last two years. So, so because, the, because, okay. So, it, and this, and you'll appreciate the algae need nutrients, but they also need <clears throat> other things. They're a plant, so sunlight and temperature. So, temperature can fuel the growth in right. areas. So, there's a combination of factors that. I, I, I understand. I'm just keying on your comment, and yep. I'm yep. critical of the point because I don't think it's valid. I think the other issues are that. We, we in, the, in the past have had much more willingness as a community to harvest the weeds on the lake than we have today. And I understand that that is an incredibly complicated topic. We're not gonna solve it here. I got, I got educated on the one other meeting I went to, um, which is why I actually, actually asked the question the way I did about the goal. Because if the goal is to have a navigable body water for recreational use, which is my, if I get to be king, that's what it is. I'm not king for the record. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I'd run both harvesters all the time, and I would argue with the DNR till the end of time to make it happen. And uh, and I would, if I had to litigate it, I would litigate it. And the fact that there's a precedent been set that we had been able to do it forever, I, I would go fight that fight. That's that's Steve Gedeke's naive view of the world. Um, but so if it's not phosphorus, what is it? Can 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 we answer that question as long as the topic was raised? There is there is the uh, zebra mussels that have come into the lake too. And Huge because impact. Of that, yeah, it's a huge impact with the clarity. Yep. And with the clarity, you know, the sunlight yep. goes down in the weeds, or not the weeds, but the, it's actually the native vegetation that is actually growing faster, too. Right. And, and that, that's another issue, too. And that seems to be really cl clearly responsible for the milfoil growth, but what about the, the, I forget the name of the fibrous blooms we had I this year algae. that were out of control. Is that also driven by the zebra mussels? Filamentous algae. I'll, I'll, take your, I'll take your word for it. Yeah, so that, um, <clears throat> so Mike Kenny, the administrator, uh, so a couple factors. Um, that tends to be also nutrient driven, but probably more nitrogen. Yep. So then there, so where are these sources? Um, you know, around Forest Lake, we know of roughly 30 different endpoints. Um, we just haven't had the resources to go out and do all of it. We're looking at some low cost technology, lower cost technology. Um, for us to work with volunteers to go out and sample all these smaller uh, inlets, uh, pipes, or whatever, to try to examine if there are you know, smaller places with more concentration that could lead to other issues. Um, we're seeing some other anomalies <clears throat> in the eastern basin where the, um, uh, at the lower water table or the lower level in the lake, we're seeing a lot of release of phosphorus from the, from the sediment after you know, decades and decades and decades of, uh, of 
I guess, higher than natural inputs. Uh, so there's that legacy piece that we're also dealing with. Um, right. And if there were, if there were beacons out there and all the phosphorus and nitrogen sources that we could go out and, you know, collect, uh, we'd, we'd, we'd do that. Uh, but it, as you can, um, appreciate it's more complicated. A couple of things that will come on next year for a second lake in particular in the South side will be the completion of our project over on Shields Lake. So, um, that is in the hundreds of pounds of phosphorus reduced coming into, into Forest Lake. Um, so, but then that's the, another complicating factor. We, you know, as we clear up the water, then the, the plant uh, community will, will be more robust. A lot of that is actually coontail. The, um, um, the original wild milfoil is not that bad, or it's not as extensive given the total number of acres. I think actually the city also only operates one harvester at this time. Bar think, bar barely. Yeah. Well, I think, no, I think in all fairness, I think it was operating pretty full time, but the problem still be is... I, I, I can just give you what is virtually data because I have a lot of observational points on this. When I first moved up here, they ran two harvesters virtually all daylight hours all summer long. They had high school kids out there doing it. Uh, they used to pull multiple dump trucks per day off of the boat launch on Third Lake. We don't run anything close to that now. And this summer, uh, the, the guy who runs the, the Ems Rising out here, who runs the, the Forest Lake Lake Association, you know, they were limited to a, a certain number of hours in a very tight geography where they could harvest. You're talking ap apples and semi-trailers. So it's not even it's not even comparing fruit. I mean, they're... Right, part of it right now is that they are limited by a DNR permit. The, the, that, that, the, exactly, so, that's my point. I said yeah. that's why I would litigate it personally if I were king, I would just, Say, look, you're destroying the lake, and and we know we've had a long-standing problem with native and your, and now Eurasian milfoil, and harvesting is essentially the only answer to keep navigable navigable waterway, unless you're going to use tons of herbicide, which carries its own problems. And the nav we know on Forest Lake, and we again we have decades of experience on Forest Lake that we know that the, that the harvesters work very well, and they're relatively inexpensive to operate. Why in the world the DNR would say you can't do that, and why we as people who are in the watershed district would say that's okay? Again, to me, I know nothing, but I get to have an opinion because everybody has one, right? My, my opinion is I, that's madness. And uh, the lake's gone downhill dramatically since we stopped harvesting. Well, I think um, the, the board has talked about the harvester pretty extensively. I bet year. you have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I, I don't think that there's any uh, substantial, I mean, there are simply guidelines that the DNR has, and that's not anything within right. our realm that we can, we can manage. Um, but, no, but, that, but again, you know, if there were infinite money and resources, which there never are, right. we, we could choose to fight that in other, other venues, including the courts, to say, get out of our sandbox. And I, I think, um, but again, this is about what the goal is. And I think if we, if we have a goal that we want a navigable waterway for recreational use, um, we can't have the kind of density of, of weeds to use layman's terms that we have in the in the lake today. And I'll just tell you, so I, I sit up on Second Lake on my deck, my wife and I sit out there all the time, as you can imagine. I bet I, bet I heard 500 instances of people pontooning, stopping, backing up their boat. Pontooning, stopping, backing up their boat to get the weeds off the prop. That's not the water experience that we want to have, I don't think, in this community. And um, we have to drive to get to a different outcome. I, I, I'm also, your comment about phosphorus input on the lake, I was surprised this last year in that uh, my neighbor who lives on um, Highway 97 and Hilo, I live on Hilo, Hilo, depending upon, I say Hilo just to take my wife off, so uh, Hilo. And uh, so uh, there was, has been a long standing wetland there, uh, cattails, uh, probably two acres of cattails, and, uh, or at least an acre. And uh, when I noticed that the cattails were disappearing, so I called the DNR and said, hmm, I didn't think you could do that. And they, they went and talked to them or whatever. And then they kept disappearing. So I called the DNR back and said, so what's the deal? I thought people could not destroy wetlands. And they said, meh, private property, basically they can. And uh, so those wetlands now are largely gone. They're down to about 10% of what they were before. And that happens to be about 300 yards from the lake. Um, it was a major area of water rolling in off of the drainage from Highway 97 to accumulate and be filtered, the purpose of wetlands, or why we all love wetlands now, we used to call them swamps, right? Uh, and, uh, that, and so somehow in the watershed management district, there is at least an attitude among the DNR that it's not okay to cut weeds in the lake, but it is okay to let somebody get rid of a bunch of wetlands 300 yards from the lake. 
So is that on the west side of Hilo? Uh, that is on uh, that is on the west side of Hilo. You must know what I'm talking about. Yeah, so we've been out there, and we actually had uh, oh, a technical well, evaluation panel meeting with it with this, uh, with Bowser and the county. Um, I will because the the city is a wetland conservation authority uh, agent for Forest Lake, so they're the ones that then lead that. So I'll be sure to communicate with the city. Um, this. This has been up. This has come up before with the okay. property owners. I know which one you're talking about. Um, so now it's now it's public that it's me. He's going to come by and shoot <laughs> my house. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, but I'll also note that um, just like we used to call things uh, swamps, now we call them wetlands. We we used to call things weeds, and now we call them aquatic native plants. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Exactly. <laughs> so a uh, couple of couple of things. We will have a couple of uh, open um, public meetings on our 10-year watershed management plan in January. So we'll um, make sure that you're on the on the list as well yeah. as now you, for all you, the... You want, you want the rebel to show up and cause problems? Is well, that what you really want? No, I mean, and, and so we, and, and we have our, uh, posted our... our um, uh, Jessica's going to pull up the dates, but, um, but also our, um, our mission statement, you know, is adaptive management. And so... You know, for for the board, it's going to be driven by what the community input is. You know, so let's see if a third of the votes are <laughs> harvest here. the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I think that yeah. Okay. I mean, the, you know, but really, I mean, honestly, show up for the the planning stuff because okay, one of the issues that we have here is we've been worried about water quantity. So we've got flooding that we got, and there's not hasn't been a lot of that, but that's coming our way. We can see it coming more. Well, don't don't bank that because if you know the history of the lake, if you've lived on Forest Lake, we've had years of severe drought, um, and I and we can all talk about what climate change means. But I guarantee you, and you know this because yep. you and I worked at the same place. Whatever model you have today for what climate change is going to do to Forest Lake is it's wrong. It's wrong. Okay, so it's wrong. We don't have a clue. It could be drought. It could be it could we be uh, three hundred years flood for th three hundred years in a row, and I think. Before we get too ahead of ourselves about planning for what we think is going to happen, let's deal with what's in front of us. Yep. And then the other one is quality. And the, the issue with water quality is typically we've been looking at it from a nutrient perspective, but we all as a board have a running argument about recreational quality. We have not solved that nut yet because that's an expensive nut to crack. It's not. The harvesters are cheap. I think no, the last year I looked... It's not, it's not that cheap. It, it could, you're talking about Eurasian milfoil. Yeah. You can't take the harvester after you raise your milk for Well, again, I would litigate that. I would, I, if we had infinite money, I would go back to the DNR and say, explain, you know, we are, the years, what I've heard the argument is, and you guys know, again, 100 times more than I do here is, we don't want, the DNR does not want people to harvest Eurasian milk foil because it causes it to spread. Right. And, and, I, and I, I call bullshit because the, it's going to spread anyway. And so it, the, the idea that this is somehow makes sense, that it, these, these, it's an accelerating factor that has any meaningful consequence in the spread of Eurasian milfoil by harvesting is, again, I just call bullshit. So if we know it's going to happen, and we know that it's dramatically impacted the quality of the lake from a recreational perspective, enough is enough. Let's harvest this stuff. And the other thing is we've had years, four years ago, I think it was, when they were very aggressive with herbicides. And, um, and it worked. I don't know what it destroyed along the way because I'm not a biochemist, but I'll tell you, it worked. And uh, why we are not attacking Eurasian milfoil with the herbicides aggressively, again, I, is there an answer for that? We actually have been. So the district and the city have been putting funds together. And, and um, so we've been uh, quite aggressively going after it since its uh, discovery, I think, four years ago. Probably what you're referring to is the... Um, the other uh, over on third really? lake, Cur no. Um. Really well, no, I, I I can just tell you on, oh, right, right off my deck, off second lake, they Flower did. We, we used to have the little the <laughs> oh, little yeah. little markers floating in the lake, right? Out, yeah. you, again, you guys probably have technical name for little markers. Um, yeah, well, yeah, and they, you know, they, they put, you'd boat up to them and go, what's that? No, yeah, don't touch this, right? <laughs> Big flag. Uh, but anyway, you know, they, they had those things littered across the south side of Second Lake for year, several years in a row, and it was, it was navigable and weed-free. So, and maybe that was just curly, curly that they were going after or native, but I, I'm, it probably kills Eurasian. It's, you know, if it's like a 2,4-D based chemical, it's going to kill everything green. And so, I, I, again, if we want to, if we want to control this, there are tools within our armamentarium to do it. 
Yes, and the issue is what can we do that we are allowed to do. So I hear your argument about litigating the hell out of it, but that's not that's not cheap either. No, and it's probably not within the realm of reasonable. But I, right. and I think we would start with collaboration, right? You yep. call it, you start with the DNR and you sit down in plain ice and say, look, this is what we want to achieve. What are the barriers? What are guidelines? What are rules? What's flexible? What's not flexible? What experiments can we do? I mean, I'm not trying to right. say we would jump to the courts here, but the thing I wouldn't do, which I will strongly advocate for, is I wouldn't just roll over and say, the rules are the rules. We can't run the harvester reserve over the Eurasian milfoil. Uh, you know that that that's not that wouldn't be in my playbook at all. Yep. And there are some experiments going on. Comfort Lake has got a group of people working on treating the milfoil uh, in a direct way that is probably more effective. But we haven't seen the results of that experiment yet. So there are things going on that, but none of it happens <coughs> overnight. And and again, it's what's within our realm to control and what can we get money for. Right. So I, I, I made that's, this that's and I made I say come to the meetings because your voice is one of the ones that will drive our next 10 year plan or drive you crazy. I did. I did. I did uh, have this conversation with the president of the Lake Association and he was bemoaning the fact that very few people in the lake are part of the association. I said, well, look, I've lived here for 28 years and I'm not part of the association and I never saw the point. And he, and he kind of said, shame on you. And I said, no, not really, shame on you. You know, that if you aren't articulating a vision that compels me to donate money, and I don't know that you're out there and I don't know what you're doing, because for 10 years, all I thought the Forest Lake Water said, or the Forest Lake, Lake Association did was hold a large pontoon float where they tied all the boats together. That wasn't worthy of my donations. And I, so we talked about the fact that they're running the harvester said, I'm no marketing genius, but I don't know why you don't fly a banner off the back of the harvester that says paid for by donations to the Forest Lake uh, Lake Association. I mean, because every time it would go by my dock, I'd throw 20s at them. And, uh, and, and they're not doing that. And so I think there's a lot of opportunities here where, again, <clears throat> business 101, pick a vision, get people aligned around the vision, figure out what, what's between you and the vision, start chipping away at the activities between where you are and the vision where you want to be. But you can't do any of that until you have a vision. And I think in a in a situation like this, we have to get many people, the thousand homeowners on the lake and the taxpayers and everybody else aligned around what that vision is, which was the point of my opening comment 20 minutes ago and I took more time than I should. So can I sit down now or do you want to? Yeah. No, that's, that's I wanna, I wanna um, with, the, uh, with the weed harvester, I'm on the association. Yeah. I'm a board member and uh, we were talking about this uh, last night as a matter of fact. And uh, Jerry's going to go to the city and we're going to work on um, the hours um, for how much they were out there versus the transportation back and forth. They only had one um, one of the uh, conveyors to go up into the... Right. We're, we're going to work on some logistics there to get more hours actually cutting well, they used to with have a, the city. There used to be a, a, a conveyor over by Willow Point mm -hmm. back in the day. So mm -hmm. if they were harvesting on Second Lake, they didn't have to go all the way across Third Lake to dump it off <clears throat> at the Lake 3 ramp. They could dump it over by Willow Point. Again, beats me. There used to be. There used to be one on the other side of Second Lake there as well. There was two of them, yeah. <clears throat> and, you know. and one of them is, is actually currently uh, not working right now. Um, it's And uh, we need to find some money to be able to get that working so we could have two and then as far as time going back and forth is going to be cut in half right which they could be cutting weeds so right or native vegetation so i i, I the, this volunteer organization closed but i used to volunteer for a a group that um, would repair cars for people who couldn't afford their cars okay it's called cars for neighbors and uh so you'd get people who were living on public assistance who needed a vehicle to get to work and they'd come in and we'd do brake jobs and ball point and ball jerry ball, whatever ball joints etc uh you want to have a community party and fix the the you, the uh the the conveyor belt there's plenty of people in town who know how to turn a wrench um, I, writing a check isn't necessarily the only answer. I, right. I can't believe a conveyor system is as complicated as most of the stuff I fixed in my life. So, <laughs> right. you know, mm -hmm. um, the, let's let's be let's figure out where we want to spend our money. Well, I guess in answer to your question, the vision and all that is laid out in our plan. So that that so is, is, it, is, it, is it fish or recreation? It is not fish. I mean, that's part of it, and it's not recreation. Okay. So, 
water quality and water quantity. Those are our marching orders. And quality is in the chemistry sense of quality, not in the recreational sense of quality yet. So, who, so uh, where do I start engaging to radically change your vision for what the lake should be doing? You're here. Okay, because I don't. Here. I, I, I would suspect strongly that most citizens would disagree with water quality as you are probably measuring it as being the primary metric. Because I would guess, and we could get data for this, you probably have the data, that the water quality over the last 30 years probably hasn't meaningfully changed. And I doubt anybody cares. It has. We're changing. It's getting worse. No, but I mean, as I, from the point being that if it was bad 15 years ago and it's good today, from an observer's perspective, I doubt anybody cares. I hear you. And so what they do care about, the fact, is that they're backing up their pontoon boats 50 times every time they go on the boat, on the lake. So let's, it, it, you know, and there, and there may be a point where water quality has gotten to the point where that, that battle is good enough, and the next battle about navigable recreational waterways should be moved to the top. Well, that's exactly the conversation that we've been having because we've met our phosphorus goals in a shorter period of time than we originally thought we, we it would take. Awesome. Uh, about 20 years earlier. Awesome. And that's because of the focused plan that we implemented the last eight years. So all of those things that you mentioned are part of the um, plan, our plan, uh, but our focus was, of all of those things, was first initially phosphorus. Which makes sense if you're going to keep the light, the, the green growth down. I, exactly. I get it. Yep. Exactly. But, <clears throat> Plus, but I live in a well, so I drink that crap every day. So yeah. it's, I get it. <laughs> so having, having the lakes um, suitable for recreation and navigable, that, those are all part of our plan. So you're bringing it up and coming to a focus meeting and talking about it there uh, will be very important in elevating those points for the next 10-year plan. Who else lives here? On, who lives on Forest Lake? Steve okay. Schmalz does too, but he's not okay. here tonight. What, uh, you live on um, Comfort. 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 Comfort, okay. Comfort and Comfort. Comfort, okay. Bone. Bone. Mm -hmm. Nobody from Clear? No, not, not in this watershed. That's in right. Oh, that's the other side. Okay, yeah. all right, all right. They're on the other side of the Because they ran the experiment where the homeowners kicked in money and the water. I, I, my wife's got a friend that lives over there, and they claim they've eradicated mm -hmm. their weeds and life is good. And yeah. One thing I have to uh, say, I'll probably regret it, but <laughs> Second Lake is very close to being determined uh, as a shallow lake. Yep. And so there's only 15 percentage points separating shallow or Second Lake to being classified as shallow. Not this year, but yeah. No, no, <laughs> no okay. always. No, That's okay. just the way it is. And um, so, so. Because we have to respect, you know, what shallow lakes are. I, I, guess I don't know point. anything what that means, so you'll have to teach me. Okay. <laughs> After the meeting. Okay. <laughs> uh, I get the sense it's not good. Well, well just hard. they they uh, they function differently. Um, there's there it's shallower in most points. There are deep points, of course, in in Second Lake, um, and and you have channels right now that you have to go through. Otherwise, your props get crushed, right? That's also true on first and third lake. Yes, yes, that's true. But of all three, second is the closest sure. to that designation. Right. So I think that has to be recognized as, as well. The other thing that, we're, that we've are that we been hearing about is how um, the the wave um, uh, action, the, the boats that are made for those uh, wave boarding, uh, in, you know. Um, wake, wake boarding. Wake boarding, excuse me, wake boarding. Or, or, or folks, surfing. But yeah, yes, yep. is that they actually it's like a mixer is what we've been told by a by an engineer and uh, it pulls the water from much deeper mm -hmm. and so you're pulling actually um, sediment up too and and so it's mixing the lake in a different way than traditional uh, motors do and so that and I just hated them because their music was loud <laughs> but that so nobody's really studied that to to see if that hypothesis is true but right. that's a suspicion of people that understand those dynamics. So that's happening more than, than before. Um, but I, I, the other thing I think Megan mentioned too is that we um, have just had a year of unprecedented precipitation, the highest on record. And so that has its own challenges that comes with that. There's more runoff coming into the lakes and you, you can't stop that from happening. So is it is it scientifically true, I'll turn to you since you're the expert, that more runoff 
makes the nutrient content in the lake worse? Or is, there, or is there an argument that high rainfall, high runoff ends up bringing a lot of clean water into the lake and it makes it better? <laughs> uh, in a lot of the monitoring data, you have more phosphorus when you have more runoff. Okay. Mm -hmm. More of everything. Yeah, more of everything. Not just well, but you, you got more water too, so it's a dilution question that I've also often wondered about whether the water quality, I mean, you get more sediment clearly, but that doesn't mean you're bringing more phosphorus in necessarily, and I wondered if it was a case where, because again, we had a, an unbelievable amount of water this year, and did the lake get healthier or did it get worse? And it was it a matter of runoff or something else? Hearing it's been worse, which tends to be the case in larger lakes sure. because the, the well, it's a shallow lake, they, so it doesn't it doesn't apply to my shallow lake. Well, a large lake, the nutrients <laughs> will settle into the lake bottom before yeah. it sure. runs yeah. out, even yeah. in a high water year. So yeah. Yeah. it's impacted. Okay, all right. Well, good for people to know. And the mm -hmm. issue is science, of course. This is natural science. You think our science that we worked on was difficult? Yeah. Try working on this crap. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I've been on the board since 2006. I'm. It's like I shake my head all the time. Yeah, we get a high water year, the phosphorus loads go down. We get right. a high water year, they go up. We get a low water year, they go up. We get a low right. water year, they go down. What the hell? Back to my point. <laughs> Cut weeds, they're gone. That's all you need to know. Oh, they come back. <laughs> Believe me. Cut them again. Yeah, we keep cutting them. So, all okay. Right. Am I so, off the hot seat? Yeah. Thank you. All I right. Mean, we probably spent more time than we would have normally, but thanks. <laughs> all right. Let's move on to the aquatic invasive species update. Mike? President Managers, um, I don't think there's anything uh, significant to report from the last meeting other than uh, we will have the year-end summary data on our boat launch inspections and uh, other related activities, uh, a presentation by Garrett that, um, Next month, so. Next month, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and we're still waiting on the villager tow results from Bone Lake, so we still don't know the results of that yet. Uh, correct. Okay. It sounds like it's coming, but it's just not here yet. Okay, any questions on the AIS report for anyone, from anyone? I, uh, no, I just wanted to bring up, though, that um, I became aware that um, Chisago County had requested that EOR do a little comfort uh, report on on uh, AIS, and um, I was I'm not sure I like that. Um, I think that if they if they want information from our district, that we should be providing it. And um, there was a misstatement in the in the document that went to Chisago County that I found that got corrected, and the next day was sent out on the corrected version. And that's good, um, but I think that's something we don't have to talk about it tonight, but maybe the board can think about it, and if there are reports in the future that outside entities request that they run through us first so that we can make sure that uh, the information being shared is correct. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Okay. Anything else? All right, let's move on to new business. The MAUD delegate appointments. <laughs> I would imagine this is, this is the normal thing, so. so who um, wants to be appointed? I think it's only me. Are you going, right? I'm going. Okay, good. Steve Andrew Smaltz is going as to well. Go. Yeah, Steve's going. Steve yeah, Smaltz? Oh, he, he yeah. changed his mind. Okay, good. So. Um, well, there's room for three. Yeah, yeah I would. I would suggest uh, Manager Anderson and Manager Smaltz as our primaries and, and Manager Dibble as our, our alternate. Does that make sense to everyone? Mm -hmm. All right. I guess I'll make that motion since I said all the words. <laughs> I'll second. All right. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Mod resolutions, delegate instructions. So we have a whole packet of resolutions here. And <coughs> wow. Well, Mr. President, <clears throat> managers, just the one thing I'll note is that the two resolutions that the district put forth have been uh, recommended for not approval by the resolutions committee. Um, <coughs> it was uh, certainly a disappointment 
uh, for me at the statewide administrators meeting because some of the administrators were on that committee and you know, some of the rationale on the one for the incorporating the soil management practices that Manager Mo had put forth. Um, they said, well, DNR is already supposed to be doing this, even though <clears throat> county or watersheds that required permits for such related activities or their um, uh, or county staff uh, readily admitted that no one had ever seen anyone ever ask for any plan for mitigating the runoff uh, rather than inf trying to increase infiltration. So um, I, I don't know if there's an opportunity to uh, provide um, an amendment of any sort to either of these um, based on the recommendation of the resolutions committee on the nutrient management one uh, with the idea to use the um, MRTN, the maximum return to nitrogen, which is the University of Minnesota's recommendation. Um, at least one person that's on was there was from the River Valley and farms with her husband and says, well, you can't trust these recommendations and our, our soils are different. All the usual myths about yep. why we can't follow these uh, economic, you know, or these recommendations to maximize profitability. You know, so the concern, you know, the interest seems to be more in maximizing yield. But um, so that was, uh, you know, discouraging in spite of, you know, I mean, I just said, well, university has decades of research and tens of thousands of data points. What are you basing this decision on? You know, so it, um, but again, I mean, maybe it's something that we just need to continue on, um, get more feedback from the, from the board or from the committee and uh, challenge some of this thinking. But there are two very important things given the fact that statewide um, water quality impacts are 80% of them are derived from agriculture. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to, Mr. Chair, uh, mention that you can bring a resolution on the floor. So any of these that were rejected by the committee can be proposed from the floor the day of the meeting. Um, how do we know which ones were rejected? Um, it's, it's in, in your packet. Didn't notes. tell you. Oh, I missed that. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it's underneath the resolution. On the resolution page, it says oh, okay. what their... Uh, recommendation is so you're going to be there Mike correct for the whole whole shebang yes okay um, because I think you know you're the best person to speak to this and um, if you want to do that as a board it certainly can be done yeah I mean essentially they they use the same kind of, kind of the same rationale for both right it doesn't apply in all cases so it's not worth doing I mean, that was effectively the bottom line for both of our resolutions. It, right. This is the only thing in the state, though, that doesn't apply to all, to all things equally, mm -hmm. right? The only thing in any of these resolutions that only applies to a small part of the state. That's BS. This is, this is statewide. So, I, 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 I mean, I understand the, the, the you know, desire not to, to change too fast, but I think we're just going to have to keep pounding this back at them that, you know, these things need to be dealt with and they're important. If the words that we used are, are, are the problem, the, the title ought to be at least sufficient to tell you that we're trying to accomplish a particular thing and, and the backgrounds kind of stuff. So. It, I think we're going after the right kind of things, but obviously we're not going to have a, a, a very favorable audience for this at the, at the meeting, so we'll just have to keep uh, bringing it back. Well, the makeup try. of the committee is largely non-ag, so they're relying on largely one kind of two people that yep. have some knowledge of it. and I've sat with some of those people at the MUD meeting. And, yeah. And, oh. Um. Yes, yeah, so there's a good share that's that's um, 
rule. I think it's probably <clears throat> half and half, so so I think they're represented. But w it, was there enough guidance to make changes to the resolution that's satisfactory to you? Or is it, the, is it the concept rejection? It's largely the concept, I mean. Would you change <clears throat> anything to make it more palatable to a wider audience? Is there anything in the language that can be honed? Because I think we should do it from the floor. I got a sense that MRTN was a, was a hot button. I think it's the isn't applicable to Northwest Minnesota. I think those are two things that, that seem that uh, they were concerned. But that's just not accurate. I know, that's I what mean, I mean. So then I don't know how to argue against this. I the argue when that's... people are willing to stand up and say. You get passionate. Yeah, well, that's, and you stand up you and, you, and you convince them. Steve, you want to go right to this meeting? Of your position. <laughs> are you available? Or? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Chuck. Uh, Mr. Chair, board members, just to differentiate between the two re resolutions, the resolution on soil management uh, best practices, the, the be it resolved is that, that Mod should support incorporating those into groundwater appropriations permitting. Uh, one response from the committee is that it already is incorporated into soil management permitting. And in fact, the, the, the application um, to the DNR for an irrigation appropriation does in fact have a section that requires the applicant to submit a uh, soil management plan approved by the SWCD. So on the face of it, it would seem that, th that it is a correct rationale that what you're asking for already has been done. It would seem that the question is, is the way this is incorporated into the permit meaningful? Are the plans meaningful? Are the SWCDs? requiring the right things. So maybe the goal of the, of the district isn't met yet because those things are not true, but on the face of it, the resolution appears to have been accomplished and it would seem the next step would be to, you know, become more knowledgeable about how the SWCDs are implementing that and work at that level or, you know, or gain um, support for, uh, for example, formalizing more strongly what the SWCDs need to obtain from applicants. Or what the DNR needs to look for in their permit application, because if they're not looking for this plan, then what difference does it make, right? No one's submitting them, then the DNR might be falling down on the job, and right. we should be working with the DNR. That's, that's more likely. But that's more my, my take on that was that, because when the soil and water conservation, because some, some districts are kind of dual-hatted in this role. Sure. And they said, well, we've never seen a request or seen anything. So basically the DNR, if, if there's a requirement, there, it's, not a, it's not a required check yeah. in the box. Or it's already checked. <laughs> right, somehow they're, they're just assuming something that maybe yeah. is not accurate. That, and that, that's true. I, did, I, I forgot about that part of that one, that that one really was saying, look, it's already covered somewhere, so why are we replicating? <clears throat> Well, there's another piece, too, that just reading through this, um, it's an indicator if a conservation plan approved by the SWC, SWCD has been developed for the acreage you propose. Um, there's a lot of them that have um, a conservation plan, but it's probably to, it may not be to the, to the level that we would be looking for. It might be two times the tolerable soil loss, or 2T, as they call it. Yeah. So and we may be after then, um, Something more best strange. management practice, right? That would that would um, result in greater infiltration. That's the whole point of the resolution. So maybe it's a matter that we would then petition the DNR to ch to change the standard uh, for the conservation plan to mean that it's to T. Got to meet a very, particular yeah. right. Right. So then that would increase yeah. infiltration. So either way, it's probably a conversation between a watershed the SWCDs and the DNR mm -hmm. to strengthen this provision of the soil management best practices in groundwater permitting mm -hmm. appropriations. So, so that one, uh, maybe there's another way to, to write it up or to word it. Um, 
And I don't know about the other one. I, I, like I said, I, I got the sense that MRTN and the fact that it wasn't applicable in northwest Minnesota seemed to be the, the biggest issue. I don't understand why. And the, yeah, and the because blanket the, mandate comment. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a well, the, the four bullet points, I don't see what Chuck referred to. In no, the that's packet, on the next one. Sorry, that's on oh, this on one. on this one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, number seven, though, um, more information is needed. This isn't applicable to Northwest Minnesota. I'm not sure why. MRTN values are determined for corn and soybean, not all fields. Do we know that to be true? I read this as being a practice that could apply to any soil type and any crop type it's generally the focus has been on uh the corn okay so then it's for those but it, corn and soybeans dominate you know I, I don't know what i'd have to look it up but it, it's probably something 80 90 percent so we it could be revised mm -hmm. to say that it's for um crop uh Cropland that is that in, that is uh, um, has corn in the rotation. Corn in the rotation. Yeah. Well, maybe with that type of revision, yeah. it could be brought to the floor. Because mm -hmm. then it would because remove the, those two points. Yeah, perhaps. exactly. Yeah. Well, you satisfied their yeah. their questions right. on taking it out. Mm -hmm. And and they're looking at it. The last point is blanket mandates are usually problematic since conditions vary widely across the street. Well, that's true, that's true. Mm -hmm. And if the study and the research is, is limited to corn and soybean fields, then we should say that. And then it's covered. And then it may be more palatable to the uh, to being approved. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. Is that something you think we could present at the meeting, Mike? Why don't we leave it open? Why don't why yeah. don't uh, I'll make the motion that we leave it up to staff to revise resolution number seven uh, for for um, possible introduction on the floor from the floor. Yeah, because I think um, a real minor. I'll, I think even in the final, therefore, be it resolved. I think all you have to do is into management of all uh, corn fields or something like that. Mm -hmm. You could real minor and then. I could contact the University of Minnesota to see if fact I, I would have to believe that the notion that this is not applicable to Northwest Minnesota is is inaccurate, but I'll confirm that I don't know. from the university. I know they grow a lot of potatoes up there, but yeah. maybe it's not uh, corn. Potatoes, I have no idea. wheat, I don't mm -hmm. know what, probably more wheat in that area. Yeah. Chuck. Beets. Mr. Beets. Chair, do we have a, a motion awaiting a second? Mm -hmm. We do. What are, what are we? Um, uh, motion for staff to revise resolution number seven to be put possibly re uh, resubmitted at the at the mod meeting. Are we right? discussing any of the other ones? That's that's uh, that's correct. That motion is for staff to determine um, uh, revising number seven so that it can be brought to the floor. Now, if staff decides not to do that or they can't support that change, then uh, we won't do it. Of course. Okay, I'll second. Motion been made seconded. Any other discussion? I don't like number one. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, so we're going to do that with number You didn't like number one? Mm. No, it seems to contradict a couple of the other ones. Like there was, um, there was the managing stormwater flows through increased water storage. There was the um, Ramsey Washington one. I worry that the way that they're approaching number one is to streamline it by removing protections from downstream communities. I didn't get any sense reading this whatsoever that they're not just pushing the water problem onto their neighboring communities. They want to require the DNR to manage the lake level and they want to require the DNR to allow permits to go through as the applicant writes them, which makes me a little bit nervous that they're just forcing the DNR to allow them to dump all their water on their neighbors. Hmm. Bluntly. I mean, maybe that's not what they're going after, but I do really like how other groups in here have written their resolutions that have similar concerns. But number one seems to contradict 
how the others are are looking to mm -hmm. deal with that. Do you remember? Were you there, Mike, at this when these? Were? I was not part of the. Okay. Uh, were you there? Resolution. No, committee. this is the committee okay. that does this. So mm -hmm. I'm not on that committee. So we're we're not. Based on Jen's comments, we're not highly in favor of number one then being yeah, shoved not. through. And Jen, you said you had some experience with this? Yeah. At, uh, yeah, I mean, Ramsey Washington Metro Watershed District has a resolution in here too mm -hmm. that basically deals with the same issues. They they were dealing with trying to get water away from a certain community, um, and they were going through all of the you know like all of the different discussion points on how do you get rid of it without causing problems downstream, um, and they you know like they put a lot of effort into figuring out why there was a, an issue and finding creative ways of dealing with it instead of, I mean, the, maybe I'm just reading this wrong, but it just, it feels like the resolution number one is wanting to just flush the problems to the surrounding communities. I, well, I read it as they wanted to streamline the process right, of getting the a permit. Right, the way that they write it yeah? is the what, what requiring in particular? the DNR. Mm -hmm. Okay to allow applicant permitting success. So if the permit, if the permittee writes the application mm -hmm. in a reasonable manner, awesome, fantastic. But if the legislature is gonna step in and tell the DNR that they have to allow you know, the water level to be flushed out or the, the ditches to be excavated, or you know, like I it just, it, it's more in the fine details that I'm, I'm a little bit anxious about it. Like I don't want them <clears throat> dredging everything out and flushing everything out and that to be what the DNR is required to approve. Okay, did I we want downstream communities to be protected. From did, did we vote on our seven? Yeah. Okay, so that one's passed. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, Mike, Mike, did you have your hand up? I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, just, um, as President Manager, I'll just note that this district is the, in the valley, in River Valley, which mm -hmm. typically has a lot of flooding, but also they are getting, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars to try to s do storage. Right. So it's really in in conflict with a lot of their mission. Right. You know, so um, that's, I, I appreciate the fact that you're bringing this up because, um, <clears throat> so while the idea of maybe trying to make government is more efficient is, is one matter, but the background, you know, the lake drawdowns, they're, they're, they're saying that we believe that the weight of ice on the chain of lakes force water into drainage ditches. You know, well, is there any scientific basis behind that or is that just a, some uh, reason maybe to go after the DNR and, and you know, um, so um, we have these outstanding, you know, issues around the state um, and if any place in the state needs more uh, water to be held back. It's seemingly up there. Um, you know, there again, it's, I'll also suggest for that particular region, if they change some of their cropping practices, they could store a lot of water or infiltrate a lot more water than they have presently. Um, but <clears throat> overall, I'm not sure that the uh, intention of the resolution aligns with um, the stated purpose for the request. Well, if, I assume that someone is going to have to get up and speak to that issue at the meeting to try to bring this point out so that people have an opportunity to vote on this re resolution with, uh, with knowledge and data. So are we asking someone to do that? Well, I don't think we, we do that. But, you know, I, I think I didn't really spend a lot of time on this one but until you brought the issue up. But um, now I just reread it and more carefully. And um, it really looks like it's a DNR management problem. So what's causing this is they're not, they're not uh, with the higher levels of precipitation. The lakes up there are swelling. And it's pushing more water into the streams, which are backing up onto the farms and causing 
their ditches to fail. So it's really not the permit process, but the oversight process that's, at, at, that's failing. But if you look at the proposed resolution, mm -hmm. that large paragraph, that large whereas, is all about difficulty completing the DNR permit process for that's landowners. What, that's what I'm saying. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of the things that they're talking about streamlining could be viewed as getting rid of things that are problematic and expensive. That's, that's what I'm saying, is that it, these two here are talking about the DNR not doing what they should be doing on, here, these two, I'm sorry. These no, two I, I, I'm talking about this. This yeah. is the actual resolution. Mm -hmm. I know, this so, is the background for it. And that whole paragraph is all about how the permitting process needs to be streamlined. Because that's what they're perceiving to be the problem. Right. Is they're not acting fast enough on their permit request to to clean out these streams and that's causing the damage to their their tiling systems. Mm. So and and the point of that is that the water bodies are getting over mm. uh, overgrown or sure. not grown, overflown, if right. you will. Yeah. Flowed, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. They're swelling, basically, and they're putting causing pressure on on um, the, the downstream mm -hmm. creeks or streams that are that are going past the farms. I think it needs work. I mean, even if it's just clarifying mm -hmm. the reactor. after. So we're not going to support that one then, correct? Chuck. Sure. Or we should make a motion, I suppose. If I'm allowed to, Kibitz would comment. Um, I just know that they're recently in different situations. We I've with clients and reading that there's a general issue, which is simply that there's more water coming down into a given area with a given conveyance system, whether it's urban or, or ditch systems. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just creating situations where you've got upstream and downstream conflicts, whether it's flooding upstream, flooding downstream, flooding upstream, habitat downstream, uh, you know, high groundwater upstream, flooding downstream. And um, we're just entering into a regime where as a substantive matter, we have technical issues and we don't yet have a process for how to mediate those and come up with the best solution. So my sense in reading this is that part of it may be DNR bureaucracy, but part of it may be this fundamental issue that we don't yet know how to deal with. And if you simply create a, uh, a DNR process that's more expedited without reaching a better general understanding of how to deal with these new issues, right. you're gonna end up with, with those who are seeking to move the water away from themselves having the advantage over the impact that's occurring mm -hmm. downstream. Right. Yep. That's exactly right. Yep. The DNR is not, probably is underfunded and can't do what they need to do given this change that's occurring, this They're broad not response change. Properly. Well, and even if they could and did respond on time, wouldn't they also be at risk of being sued by the downstream community mm -hmm. that said, hey, mm -hmm. I didn't want this. Where'd all this water come mm -hmm. from? Yeah. Yeah. So so as you were saying, we're in not in favor of one as a district, so we would be voting no on that one. Okay. Are there any others in the list that people had issues with? Mm, I didn't really like two either. <laughs> Um, I, w I wanted to jump back to number eight. That's our second one from yep. Comfort Lake Forest Lake. Yep. Uh, just to see if we want to do the same thing on that one. Leave it to there, staff. Yeah, if, if leave it to staff and if there's any corrections or enhancements that can be made, um, we, can, we can attempt to propose that from the floor as well. Sure. You want to make that as a motion? Yes, I will make the same motion for number eight. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. More work for staff. <laughs> All right, and you didn't like number two, you said. Yeah, but this one's, this one, um, to a lesser degree. Um, so the ideas for how this could be solved, the state of Minnesota could abandon the, the blah, 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 blah. That paragraph is problematic in that the definition that they want to use has been tied up in court. <laughs> like, <laughs> we don't we don't want to get into something that, you know, like the national court system can't even get through. So, I'm I'm glad that the resolution portion didn't go into that. Didn't quote that. Because that just, that just sounds like trouble. That sounds like lawsuits. <laughs> 
And then I, I guess I just, I don't know the rationale between why class two was chosen instead of class seven. I don't know if it was just expedient to just lump everything in there if they didn't have the time to decide what was originally an upland and what was originally a lowland and then split them between twos and sevens. Um, so I guess I'm neutral on that because I, I don't know enough, but just <laughs> the, the um, clean water rule caught my attention as, as something to stay away from. And so that's not in the actual resolution? It's not in the resolution. So I'm neutral on the actual resolution. So, so there's going to be some work done to try to figure out a an actual solution to the problem, but mm -hmm. this is proposing that it start being worked on, I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. So we're not strongly opposed to it, but it could walk into a well, if they, if they If they start doing this, if that's <laughs> the direction that they go, I would, <laughs> I'd be wary. Okay. I don't know if I'm good. All right, so, should we, what, what would we take as a, a position on number two then? In favor of or not in favor of? Well, I don't think it should apply to the entire state if it's an issue in the Red River Valley headwaters mm. area. Why not just say that? Yeah, say that. Because if you read that background, um, they're talking about under ideas for how this issue could be solved. The state of Minnesota could abandon the overregulation instituted by the Dayton administration and recognize the EPA's own exclusions. That's the well, one she's talking yeah. about. Yeah. That one's very problematic. That one's not it, good. It's very problematic. <laughs> yeah. Because the whole point of that was to restore quality to the waters, and they're saying, get rid of it because it's inconvenient for us. But. They do talk in that third or fourth paragraph down, the our watershed is at the headwaters, yeah. that this is, this is, a, problem for this is a problem for them. Our watershed is a drainage ditch authority for 65 systems in three counties. The majority of our systems are in need of significant repairs and or improvements. Well, here's the other thing. Why haven't you been maintaining them? Maybe that's the problem. They've allowed them to get into disrepair. Because they're funded by private landowners. And well, that's yeah. The problem we were facing here if we didn't get 103B. Nobody wants to pay for anything. Nope. I know. <clears throat> but that's it. They talk about it being out of repair, and now they, you know, they're now they have sediment, eroded sides, instead of moving water, <laughs> they're holding water. holding water. Cattails are growing. So they're not functioning the way they should. So why not just tell them to repair your own ditches <laughs> instead of opening up a potential can this, of worms? This thing. I, I would say no to that one, personally. All right. So we're going to... Sounds like we're in agreement that no one would be there. All right. So any other comments about any of the other um, nine... Resolutions. I, I'm in favor of yes or three as a yes. That's that's uh, increasing the general operating levy. We've been trying to do that for several years, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. and uh, two hundred and fifty thousand is just not adequate. That's crazy. These days. I think they are the ones that mention what their tax capacity would be if they use the cap. Yeah. It would be nine hundred and fifty one thousand in twenty twenty instead of two hundred and fifty thousand. That's how out of date that number is. Right. It's, it has not kept up with inflation no. or anything else. So. All right. I, I guess. I, like I said. I'm it, okay with four. Four is yes. Five. Any concerns about five? I wanted to know if they, if they were trying to be a voting member on the technical evaluation panel. They like, kind of sideswiped it. Because it, it sounds like they want to be a voting member of the technical evaluation panel. Oh. Because you can be a voting member or you can just be a member, and a voting member is kind of, it sounds like what they were getting at. Technical representatives of watershed. Wetland. Hmm. Well, I'm, I was assuming from this that they are not part of the wetland um, authority, though. 
And so this is how I read that is that they wanted to um, they wanted to make sure that district technical employees could be part of that. That's a question for Chuck, actually. Is there any prohibition on watershed district um, staff or technical people being on advisory committees for uh, the wetland um, conservation folks? I don't know what that term is, but um, I'll do you. Yeah, Madras Spence, uh, Madras Anderson. There's not that if one. if the um, if the watershed district is the implementing entity, then um, a staff person for the district is an official member of the TEP. So this resolution would apply where the the city, for example, is the implementing authority, and the watershed district doesn't have an official role. And in that case. Um, they certainly could be made a member, but it would require legislation to do that. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, and I think that's what the, this is what the rest. This is what's being that's asked what the for here. That's what this to push that legislation says. forward to make it possible. Well, and like Chuck was mentioning, there's there are official voting members of the technical evaluation panel outlined in the Wetland Conservation Act. But you can have non-voting members at the technical evaluation panel. So if they want to vote on it, they're going to maybe want to be a little bit more clear. Yeah. That official member means voting. Yeah, and they do say in item one in the background that they're looking for uh, the same value for comments as the te official TEP mm -hmm. representative. So it sounds to me like they're trying to become official. Mm -hmm. And that's not provided in statute as it they, exists. Yeah, they would have to change the Wetland okay. Conservation Act. Uh, at the federal. <laughs> okay. Well, that's think, a mountain Mr. to climb. President Manager, I think it also might, though, um, require then if you're at least an official member that you're notified when these meetings exist. Because right now, I imagine from experience, what's happening is that there are reviews being conducted without the Watershed District's involvement. But right. anybody re can request to be on the mailing list of the technical evaluation panel. If I mean, there's there's some categories, but hmm. maybe maybe they're just not paying attention to the rules. And Chuck, this is another question for you. Uh, if the governing law is federal, um, the request here is to amend statute. I w would assume that that means uh, Minnesota statute. Uh, can that be done if the federal legislation isn't changed? Uh, Matt Anderson, are we, are we talking about Resolution 5? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, that would just be the State Wetland Conservation Act that would be amended. State, oh, okay. State law. So it does, okay, okay. Well, that's good. Well, I don't have a problem with that. I think I mean, it's okay. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Number 6. Any comments or concerns about number six? I'm good with that. I'm good with that one too. All right. Number nine. I like it. That was one okay. of the ones that you said was mm -hmm. well done, right? Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. I have a question on number nine. Would the um, Army Corps of Engineers be involved in something like that? Being that it's on uh, navigable water? What kind of development? As far as um, putting in storage strategies. Mm -hmm. They, um, you mean could they be? Yeah, could oh. they be? I mean, yeah, yeah that that's what it's saying. Mm -hmm. I think they can only be involved in navigable waters. They, they and, can't. And Minnesota River Basin is navigable waters. Mm -hmm. right. The local sponsor for so as far as using state money should it be written differently or at least make a process of trying to go over and uh, getting money from federal because of it being navigable waters I don't, I don't know that they it are. has it has both in the resolution both Oh, okay. I didn't read mm -hmm. that part. Okay. 
No, I think it's... All right, I apologize. I didn't read that part. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm okay with that one. Okay. Uh, how about resolution number 10? Chinese yes. mystery snails. It sounds like another invasive species coming our way. Mm -hmm. So let's get on top of it this time. That's what I say too. How about number 11? And the, res the committee's recommendation was to, that they're not in favor of this one, and the reason was they felt it was not our fight. <laughs> so, and it is about pesticides and herbicides mm -hmm. um, as carcinogens. Uh, it's obviously somebody's fight, but I'm not sure whose. We do have a lot of uh, uh, irons in the fire, but are we okay with the, the fact that it is not recommended to come forward? This is something that would benefit from a lot more um, PR, a lot more education before it goes before the I don't think so. I think it's just a statement, honestly. This one, yeah. this is more of a statement of support. Supports and I, legislation. And I, yeah, and I, I think they're not championing it, but if somebody else is doing it, we'll pile on. I think, it, yeah, I think it's just great. a good statement to have. So this would be in Maud's tool bag. If something came up during their mm -hmm. discussions with the Capitol, they would say, yeah, we're mm -hmm. okay. So if this gets brought up by Riley Purgatory from the floor, then uh, we should vote yes for that, right, yes. as delegates? Okay. I think so. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, number 12. Yes. <laughs> Definitely want that one. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be some stuff coming. And it's agreed? Agreed? Yeah. I mean, the, I, I haven't... They, they, they recommended not to favor the resolution because the study hasn't been done by professionals and boating safety issues are enforced by the DNR and water patrol. So watersheds don't have any ability to enforce even if we, if we do support it. So my sense is that the committee is saying it's not our fight again, but they didn't actually say those words. So No, but I think those two paragraphs on the background page, the mm -hmm. two last paragraphs, there are studies they're quoting, so they've got enough support there to make that, I think, something, obviously more, more can be done, but there's already been some studies in the country that have looked at the impact of those type of boats. And I think like the last one, as mm -hmm. you said, this is really supports legislation. It's not yeah. saying that the water should, that MOD should mm -hmm. push it or write it or mm -hmm. be the champion for it. Right. So again, if this one comes back to the floor mm -hmm. and there's a chance to vote on it, we would say we would want to vote yes. Yes, absolutely. So would they consider doing more studies, especially in the shallow lakes, on this? I mean, that, that seems like the most obvious results would seems come like from shallow lakes. Seems like a good place to do some study, yeah. I think the studies are coming. I think, was it Kurt who was saying about the wake boat yeah. things, that there is more coming. And, yeah. It's just a matter of who's going to fund them. And, and you know that'll get pushed back by the legislature as well, right? There's no data to back it up. They'll, mm -hmm. do, you, they'll use the same two bullets, right? Mm -hmm. The study appears to have been done by professionals, not but a committee. This one, the, Chesa I, the Technical Advisory Committee of the Chesapeake Bay Pro Program. I'm guessing that's the one they're talking about. They're not talking about all of them. They're just pointing at that one, I'm guessing. <laughs> The Chesapeake Bay program. That's a pretty big program. It's robust. Yes. <laughs> and, and the Technical Advisory Committee is going to have all the scientists on it. Yeah. Scientific so and I'm, technical. I'm, I'm satisfied that that was looked at by professionals. Yeah. But anyways, we're already going to yeah. vote yes we're on vote that vote yes one, right? if it okay. comes back. Okay. All right, number 13. Uh, so this one is not recommended to be... Um, the, the committee's not in favor of this resolution as written because it includes a special allocation for the Twin City area, furthers the divide between rural and metro mod members. So they're saying it would be, it's, it's too focused on the Twin Cities area. And that's a bad thing? 
Oh. It's tough though because they have so much more impervious surface. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. kind of the front line for exactly. a lot of the problems yeah. that the yep. outstate could later adopt. Aren't there like tens of millions of dollars of allocation? I mean, again, it's, it's supporting additional state funding. So if it does come back to the floor, um, you'd think we'd want to be supportive of this. Type I would of think so. For, for, since we're a metro oh. watershed. I would support it, and if they wanted to change it so it's not Twin City Center, right. then. But you know, there, there's there's issues like this though outstate too. I mean, there's always a major city in yep. every area that hasn't done what they should have been doing. Well, and maybe more so in some areas because mm -hmm. they might not have had the tax base to work with the right. exactly. dorm sewer yeah. system. They can't have done anything, so they're really having mm -hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. So all right, so we're basically uh, no on the first two. Yes on all the rest, of if, and if they're already recommended to go forward, yes, and if they're not recommended to go forward and they come back, yes, and staff will work on seven and eight. Yep. I only see two no's. That's one and two, right? right. Yep. No's on one and two. Okay. Good. Right. Thank you. Do we need a resolution? We don't need a resolution for that, right? That's delegate instruction, so. Uh, just say by consensus. By consensus. Yes. We're all in favor? All right. Yes. Good enough, Mr. Lawyer. Unanimous consent. All right. All right. We have two service contracts now to review and approve the Washington Conservation District and the Chisago SWCD service agreement. President Badgers, um, so annually uh, we review at this time the Washington Conservation District service contract. Um, this one includes services for general tactical services and as well as uh, for our uh, upcoming year of water, water monitoring services as outlined in Exhibit B. So the total cost of this agreement is $149,783. $149? Yes. Oh, that's including it includes the other the, one, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Technical services portion. Yeah. And uh, MRAP is going to be separate from this? Mm, that is correct. Right. Okay. Well, I say this every year, but I, I can't vote for this contract. Um, I don't believe that they're producing what we need. We've talked about that for a long time. But I don't like their contract. And I've, I've brought up this issue before. But this contract is so one-sided. For them, I just I can't vote for it. Um, it's much different on the Chisago uh, contract. And if it was formatted like the Chisago contract, I wouldn't have a problem with it. But we've, we've dealt with the independent independence streak that um, has happened from Washington County, and it's been difficult to deal with. Um, not giving proper uh, recognition to the Comfort Lake Forest Lake watershed district for paying for and, and initiating the studies. They're submitted to the Met Council under the Washington Conservation District's name and not ours. Um, so I just don't, I, I'm just telling you, I can't, I can't vote for it. So they're essentially they're a subcontractor to us, but that's but they're not the independent. way they operate. That's not the way they operate. Right. And I think a lot of it could be corrected in the, this independent contract. operator section of their contract, but Oh, I already flipped over. I was done with it, so I got rid of it. Okay. Um, but anyway, that's that's just my position. Is there something that we could do, Mike, between you and, and staff and, and Jackie to work through this and try to push back on this? And is it something, is there a time element here that we, I mean, are we back, we're not backed into a corner, I'm assuming. We've got some time to get this approved and... All right, correct. We have time. We could bring this back next month. So is that something that you'd be willing to work with? Mike well, yeah, it's, it's all written here. Okay. I, I think I gave it to, to Mike last year okay. as well when I went through the same things. I expected that there would be some changes in that contract well, language, but, um, but I think I, you know, I, we're not doing ourselves any favor by continuing with this large of a contract okay. without getting concessions on the issues that we've been concerned about. Absolutely. So let's push back. Let's let's get them into the contract this year and make sure they're there. Okay. So, um, 
I'll vote to table this and uh, bring it to the December meeting, working with staff. A second. All right. All those in favor, aye. say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right. Thanks. Okay. All right. Now let's move on to the Chisago SWCD service agreement. I would make a motion to accept this contract as presented. I'll second. Any other discussion? All right, motion has been made and seconded. No other discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right, we approve that one. Thank you. All right, let's move on to old business. Banta property, scope of work. President managers, um, as requested, EOR has brought back a scope of work. Um, this is in regard to the potential acquisition of this property adjacent, uh, just easterly of the tax forfeit property that the district owns. Is there any questions? Uh, Dr. Funky is available to answer them. I have I have one question, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, on the first page of your memo, um, first paragraph after all the blue bulleted points, um, I think this scope is too narrow. Um, you're doing a cost benefit analysis primarily on phosphorus removal, and since our goals have been met early. Uh, it seems to me to be a waste of time to be chasing after something that's not a problem anymore. I mean, uh, I think that we should be broadening this, and we know from the very beginning of this watershed that the quantity of water coming down that system was the real problem. And um, I don't see anything in here about um, looking at that quantity issue. And I also don't see anything that relates to the urban stormwater issues. And so I would, I would just say that we need to uh, not just look at the phosphorus, but we need to take a broader look at this. And um, the, the stormwater from Forest Lake, not the lake itself, but the city of Forest Lake, is still coming down the system of ditches to a ditch that doesn't exist anymore. And um, we, need to, we need to look at this in, in a much broader area. So it's not just about phosphorus removal, but the um, enhancement of having wetland properly, properties along the Sunrise River uh, and in that area where a good portion of that stormwater is coming through from the city of Forest Lake. Uh, might be very beneficial for us. And if we don't take a broader scope, uh, we're only going to be looking at that single phosphorus item. Mr. President, yep. matters. Um, I'll just note a couple of things. Um, on task two, because um, Dr. Funky, we, we, we talked about this. So we are going to look at, um, you know, we're going to try to estimate the volume reduction benefits of that tax for property and then this alternative piece here. So that was in fact um, incorporated into the, R, well, the original engineer's work that they did um, and would be reevaluated at this time. And then also this drainage area, what we're, this, this, the reason that we would be looking at this property would be that this is the area that comes from the west out of Himes Lake. And so while it would be there, there may be a mechanism to get water over into it. It's not, it was never something that was being considered by the district engineer. So. The tech, the, uh, not the tech, the, uh, the Banta property you're talking about. Right, for, for water from, from, from Forest Lake. So oh, we'll just. It goes through our tax forfeit property, but not comes from the, the Comes what, from, from the, from the west. So, um, I mean, I certainly think that, you know, when we look at some of these other properties and try to look more holistically at this whole sunrise, which, you know, the district and um, has been discussing for some time, you know, that's really the, uh, 
the point there, especially if we were, were trying to do something in that larger reach. Um, we may recall that there was a property owner that has a large portion of that, um, I guess the northern half from north of Ducharmes after the Banta property that was interested in some kind of lease um, but was kind of waiting to see what happened with this. So I think there are some future projects and certainly we could look at that, but I think that given the timing of this, we were trying to tie it in with the Clean Water Fund grant application that we submitted and mm -hmm. will be notified of next month. So we wanted to move our um, this, this analysis along for the Banta property um, more at this, uh, at this time and then look at these other bigger issues that Manager Anderson is discussing um, more, you know, I guess forward in time, whether it's through the next round of the Watershed Management Plan or just even next year. But It was in this 10-year plan and we did nothing about it. So that's one thing, but I'm willing to concede that point on this timeliness issue with the Clean Water Fund, but I think we're still dealing with the same issue though. It's just coming from the city of Wyoming when we're looking at just that narrow area and the property above the Ducharme property because the water from Himes, if I'm not mistaken, is still coming down through an old agricultural ditch system. It's not a creek or a stream to the sunrise. And so we still are dealing with city water coming through a conveyance system that wasn't meant for it. And as long as we take a broader look at this and not just narrowly at phosphorus, then I'm okay with this. And it, it needs to be done, but we can't wait anymore on that other issue. The city is growing, Forest Lake keeps growing and growing and growing, and we keep getting more water and more water and more water. So uh, it has to be dealt with. And Dr. Funky, when is the H&H &H model work gonna be? Done, or is that what you're going to bring up next? Yeah, Mr. President and Manager Anderson, and I, 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 I want to clarify just for my understanding of, of the term broader, mm -hmm. um, other than phosphorus. <clears throat> other than phosphorus, okay. Um, or more than, I should say. More than. So for the the whole, and I just want to put into perspective, and then and then it's really up to you know what what the board needs. One, you know, there's the issue of just deciding whether or not to. Um, put an offer or go through the um, uh, appraisal, all, all those steps to further uh, looking into purchasing that Banta, the former Banta parcel. Um, also uh, going on right now, and, and we haven't brought anything, we're, we're still finishing up the last um, bit of the calibration of the H&H &H model. So we've been working in this Comfort Lake Management District um, updating the H&H &H model, really to get the hydraulics and the hydrology correct, since there's been a lot of changes since the last model, in, uh, with the focus to go back to work Greg did, uh, I don't know, last year or even, it might even be longer ago now, looking at the um, regional volume storage. So he's identified several areas. And I think maybe, Manager Anderson, that gets to your point of a, maybe a broader regional context of, there's, there's a lot of water flowing through this whole system. And you know where, where do we store it? Where are those best practices? And, and that work gets at that larger context. This scope is a little narrower, I think, as, as you've noticed, just to focus specifically, specifically on that cost benefit of, and, and phosphorus is a piece of it, um, with the tax forfeit and the Banta parcel. So we have the Clean Water Fund application on the tax forfeit project. If, if that's um, approved and then, or, and regardless if the board wants to pursue that project, we, you know, complete the designs and update the cost estimate to move that into the implementation phase. So then the purpose of this scope is just to maybe accelerate that and look more at that project in, com un in combination with expanding it onto the Banta property just to see, and primarily through the volume reductions, because that's our H&H &H model base. So that really will be our currency for determining how much phosphorus is removed. Um, we'll start there and then um, make estimates based on what we've been observing from the Bixby project in terms of dissolved phosphorus removal. Do you look at other things though? Do you look at sediment load? Do you look at uh, chemicals that might be coming off of a more urban landscape? 
We would know, um, we would have sediment as part of that H&H &H model. Um, the phosphorus and sediment are, are related when we start to look at r sediment reductions, but n there wouldn't be any other chemical parameters involved. It would simply be volume, mm -hmm. phosphorus so, and sediment. So volume is a surrogate for all the other problems, right? Primarily the in the H&H model. The higher the volume, the more likely mm -hmm. to have all those other. And that's correct. going to be done in this study. This is volume modeling, right? Correct. It's okay. so part of you. task two. Mm -hmm. okay. so volume we have and phosphorus <clears throat> reduction estimates. So it's primarily based on volume. Phosphorus is estimated based on monitoring based on data and, and monitoring data. In that. Okay. Correct. But, which we but, also have se um, sediment data from the, the right. long-term loads we have at that Himes Lake drainage. We have measurements. Mm -hmm. But this, this scope would just focus, and with a, a fast turnaround, um, our understanding was that there might want to be a decision at the December board meeting just for those two projects. So it's, you know, putting the projects into, you know, CAD drawings so we get accurate, you know, excavation quantities to put back into the model to estimate what that volume reduction would be. So it's really giving us potential information for whether we want to pursue purchasing the Bantha property. That's the goal of all this work, not to solve the regional stormwater issues. For, of, of this scope. For the, for, so this, this is really just telling us, is it worth continuing to pursue the Bantha property? Correct. And then we, we have the other work currently uh, also ongoing to look at that broader perspective. But the, the timing isn't as critical with getting back on the right. land acquisition piece. Okay. I just wanted to underscore my point, though. My point was is that on page one, we have the uh, parameters for making a decision. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be the cost benefit per pound of phosphorus mm -hmm. removed. And I'm saying that that is too narrow. I also want to just remind uh, everyone that um, I came to the board in late summer, I think it was, and um, uh, asked for permission to pursue conversations. I had started preliminary with the city of Wyoming and Chisago County about working together on uh, utilizing the natural park uh, ordinances that they have in place and, and their vision and their comp plan about protecting the natural um, clusters of oaks that still, and hardwoods that still exist, and also the natural wetland areas. And we all know that that's the least expensive way to clean our waters and to keep them clean, is to protect as much of that natural wetland environment as we can. So when you're doing your evaluation, uh, I'm asking that you keep all of those things in mind and that this isn't so narrowly focused on phosphorus for a pound. That's not our target anymore. It's all of this other stuff. And so we've got to start looking with a wider lens. Mm -hmm. So Mr. President and managers, um, in terms of, and then for our direction, um, in addition to, and it's helpful to know, you know, what, what are those decision metrics that you would like to see? So I, I think I probably simplified it and had a narrow scope, but then there, there seems to be, I'm hearing, um, in terms of task three, you know, that optimization. Um, cost-benefit optimization um, that we want to um, help lay out for managers. We can include the sediment in terms of load reductions and then also, um, you know, beyond just the cost-benefit of pollutants, just those other, I guess, added benefits and it would maybe look at what would that other 20 acres expand on that that the tax forfeit maybe couldn't offer. Or is it a protection issue? Is it better to protect that as, as it's part of the pathway along the sunrise mm -hmm. for further natural filtering rather than let it go to tillable acreage or, right. or become part of a development? What could the cost mm -hmm. to us be if they turned that into something <coughs> else because we didn't buy it, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. is the point. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying. That helps. And then also, again, just making sure that we understand the dynamics of the stormwater coming out of that section of the city of Wyoming. Um, I don't believe that there's any treatment ponds between Himes Lake and, and the area that we're looking at. So we're getting untreated 
stormwater through that system, not from Forest Lake, but from the, from the developing area of uh, the city of Wyoming. Right. Is that covered by the H&H &H model? <coughs> That's part of the H&H &H model. The Correct. Flow. Yep, we would, we would see if there's any storage. And we've got some data to calibrate the model with for, for, for Correct. some things along mm -hmm. the way. Okay. Mm -hmm. And whatever the output is from that urban stormwater. So it's not just going to be nutrients no. that, that we deal with here right. in, the, in the lakes. It's going to be mm -hmm. other things. Chlorophyll, okay. salt, mm -hmm. chemicals. chemicals. So you're just wanting to protect the natural barriers that are already mm -hmm. That already exist. If they're there and they're on that 20 acres that we might purchase, what would be the cost if we didn't protect them? To, uh, what, what would we have to do to account for that potentially? Keeping in mind also the growth rates going forward right. is, um, you know, this whole area. I mean, we've known that for, for years. It's not just new information. They might have been updated with higher numbers, but, but we knew going into this district management that, that this corridor is going to continue to keep growing. It got sidetracked a little bit after the recession, but yeah. it's back. Uh, it's back in full swing now. So has the has the um, board ever talked about creating wetland banks for like they could sell preservation credits and then use some of that funding to go buy yeah. more wetlands no, to been. also preserve? Yeah, we've, been. we've had um, trying to find the property that we can do that on. Yeah, been okay. the struggle. Yeah. Okay. Because I think Mike's reported there isn't any bank available in this district, right? Service area six, correct, Service which is the entire Lower St. Croix. There are zero acres currently available for purchase. Um, but so we have been um, reaching out. We've established a priority list of sites that we thought would be suitable, but um, we've been working on reach, doing some outreach this fall, particular uh, late summer, but no specific takers. At this time, I think it. Um, in in hindsight, when this entire farm <coughs> came for sale, um, that would have been a, a suitable time because there was actually, unbeknownst to us, until we did the analysis, some of that farmland would have been suitable, and we probably could have recouped um, the the purchase price for the value of that um, wetland bank portion and then have the additional 20 acres and ever buildings. But um, so it might be a strategy that we look at in the future. As you know. things come up. Right. Okay. I'd like that on a future agenda, honestly, because there, there are some um, properties along the way that I think are in the area, I mean, that I think we should not wait too long on and have a strategy. We can put together a strategy for those areas and uh, again, it would be far less money long term to reserve the, that property. Put it reserve. in conservation reserve, you know, whatever it is. And, um, and I think we, we've got amenable government units that want to work toward that as well. So let's, let's use that partnership. So we have uh, an adequate scope of work here. Are we all comfortable? Is it, is it, are you, are you going to update it and bring it back to us? Which Can you do that for the money that you Yeah, can you do it for the same it? money, I guess? Mr. Question. President, managers, I, I, I think um, uh, the, the one thing we could add, just in terms of um, work that may not have been originally thought about, but, uh, and I don't, I maybe I'll defer to Cecile how much, if it's a much of an added effort, I don't think it would be, but just included in one of the scenarios. Um, so we'd have our existing conditions we're looking at and, and then with the projects there to look at the sediment, the phosphorus and the, the volume reduction. But then um, putting that parcel into cropped land cover or even developed to, to get at maybe that question, just, you know, what is, what is the cost of the district of not preserving it so, you know, it becomes degraded. Right. That would be an additional cost. I'm going to volume, we're going to suspended solids, we're going to phosphorus, and doing the analysis based on that. I mean, it's, it's easy to do. Right. But uh, the additional value or cost benefit when you're adding other things like uh, uh, 
my truck for storage space. Things like that is not part of this. Okay. So that would be a, an additional task that would have to be estimated and brought back to us. But well, it would be hard, you said, right, to do that? Well, it would require some thinking. Yeah. yeah. It's, not, it's, it's going to require some cost. So, so we could approve the three tasks that are here, and you could bring us back a fourth task to add on that additional analysis. I, I just want to be clear, though. I mean, we're talking this additional analysis that we're talking about is the value of keeping it natural versus the cost or the degradation that would occur with development. Right? Is that what we're talking about when when we say additional analysis? Correct. Okay. And, and, you know, it, it, there are a lot of things involved in that too. But uh, what we're going to do in this case is we're going to wetlands and. Uh, and then eliminate the ditch to it and put the water through them. Mm -hmm. So part of the analysis is going to be, okay, if we do that, what is the benefit in terms of volume control? How much volume is going to be uh, retained and about to transpire when we do this? And there are many different design sectors we can optimize. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and basically return uh, the, you know, the benefit of returning the wetland to the natural state. That's basically what is included in our, in our scope. But we're going to have, have to add other things, other so benefits like uh, potential recreational benefits, uh, wildlife benefits, oh, no. things like that. Those are difficult to, um, it would require some thinking in terms of how we're going to be doing it. No. No. I, no, that, that was not what I meant at all. Um, I meant from the broader scope is looking beyond phosphorus. That's not our total decision point. Right. And that we're dealing with a system that has stormwater urban stormwater, and so we need to be addressing what that brings. Quantity, sediment, other things that come off of urban landscapes that you don't find in, in natural ones, or even ag ones. That, that we can do that. Okay, project. perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So, so in, and at the same cost? Yes. Okay. Okay, well, well I'm then I'm confused, because I thought we were talking about if we don't buy this property and they do something with it that we didn't, we chose not to do, we're going to have a cost to take care of that issue. Well, but we don't have the time to do that analysis oh, okay. well, is what I, they said earlier. And so... We can come back and do that later. I'm fine with that. But that's one of the things. Yeah. If we don't buy the property, then that's a risk to us. It is, but we also have partners that are going to mitigate the cost. And so we need to, I think, address what needs to be addressed in the short term. This is a grant that has to be submitted in December, I think, right? He's got his hand up. Mr. President, managers. Um, well, the grant has already been submitted, so we'll, we'll okay. find out in December. Um, but also just when we go back and look at them, the previous, some of the previous materials, we will recall that the entire parcel that we're talking about already is a degraded wetland. So it's not really feasible that anybody would do anything with that because they would have to do a replacement and mm -hmm. and, and farther actually, I mean, if anything, it's, it's maybe do we go after some additional property when we look at a much larger system in the area. Okay. But for this purposes, and I think the analysis that the two managers, you and Manager Anderson, are discussing those separations. I don't think, for your concern, I don't think it's really valid. Okay. So, but I understand now Manager Anderson's concern about the analysis. But I think appropriately, appropriately, that the engineer can do it within the current scope. Okay. Yeah, the band of wetland is already ditched. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, if we do nothing, it's, basically, we'll remain. It stays that way. Good. Now, if we take it and actually. Uh, and it and add it to the forfeit property to actually do the more penetration and, and, and one control and also second control, that's the benefit of what you're trying to assess. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. So. I will make a motion to, do we have one here? Yep. Where is it? Thank you. Uh, to authorize the administrator on advice of council to enter into an agreement with the EOR in accordance with the November 12th uh, scope of work as amended and in an amount not to exceed 13805 A second. 
Motion has been made and seconded. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Okay. Uh, Jeffers Foundation work group members. Mr. President, managers, um, you recall that I've met with a couple of our uh, community members who are also our C on our CAC um, and the um, Forest Lake Area Schools, uh, some of the staff, including the superintendent. Uh, presently, then, at their last meeting, there was um, an interest in moving forward uh, with this with a work group. Uh, the school district has indicated their interest in establishing environmental science as sort of a, a hallmark of, of the district. Um, so, and what would that mean? There, are, there were a variety of interests in this, uh, some of these initial discussions, um, some being is trying to establish an independent foundation that would perpetually fund uh, community education, both for you know, students and adult education. Um, the school district is inter interested in trying to uh, utilize more of their own community resource or resources in terms of outdoor resources, environmental education, et cetera. Um, and of course, the district has an, uh, an interest in expanding environmental awareness, uh, education uh, across the board and for water resources and also the consideration of its own future facility. So, but uh, just the other day when I talked to Mike Miron, who's representing or kind of the lead for the Forest Lake Area Schools, um, uh, we're likely to have another meeting here uh, this next month. Whether or not one of the board members is at that <coughs> is maybe not yet critical as we try to formulate a few more things. Mm -hmm. But I think just going forward, we would look to have a, a board member and I can inform that board member or members when that time is right to maybe come into this meeting because I think we, we need a little bit more work, but I just wanted to give you an update, but then also to, for, the, for the board to consider what there might be. Um, <clears throat> but after we frame it up a little more, maybe I'll bring something back and at that time, so. So you're looking for a volunteer or two, or you will be? I think in the future, I don't, I think based on our conversation just the other day, uh, or yesterday, I guess, with uh, Mr. Miran, it's that I think that we can, we have a little bit more work to do as this initial work group before we start inviting other leaders and community members in on the, on the discussion. But please do start thinking about it. Okay. Mr. Chair, I'd like to volunteer for that too when it comes time. Yeah. Okay. So Jim for sure and okay. Steve maybe, but I know Steve's busy with the one watershed, one plan, so mm -hmm. I may be able to participate as well. So. My daughter uh, went to an environmental studies school down in Apple Valley at the, mm -hmm. at the zoo. Mm. And it was a very good experience. Yeah. 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 Very good. Mm. Nice. There we go. We have All to right. do that. All right. Then item C, comprehensive uh, data review update. Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. can I um, can I just make a recommendation? Um, given the amount of mm -hmm agenda that's left, is this something that can be addressed in December? Steve will be back, I know this is important to him, and uh, it is a discussion that I don't think we should rush. Right, okay. No, so if that's, that. if that's okay mm -hmm. All right. with everybody, um, I would it. move to table it till the December meeting. Either one, the 12th or the 17th, we have a special meeting on the 12th. So if that's appropriate, we can add it to that agenda. Yeah. Okay. That's a motion to table. Uh, do we need a, a, this is always confusing, Chuck, Mr. Rules guy. Do we need a motion to table? I thought we could just table something. It's, well, it's, it's not a motion to table because there isn't a motion on the floor. Okay. So a table, you would table an existing motion. You're basically just 
acting to not take up the agenda item. We're tonight. postponing so the agenda item. If you want to do that officially, you can nope. just have a motion to, to move it. Okay, motion to postpone, basically. Okay. Isn't that what I just said? Yeah, it's, <coughs> it's, yeah, table. it's not actually table. But well, okay, motion to, to postpone until um, either of the December meetings. Mm -hmm. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. One watershed, one plan update. Here we go. Okay. Tell us what's been going on. Well, it's been very busy the last three weeks. And um, uh, as you know, uh, Jessica, can you pull up that, that uh, slideshow? Um, I laid out the direction that our committee um, had decided was a good one to go into and presented that to, to the board at the last meeting. I only had about three or four pages. We just started putting this together. And um, it was enhanced after we started working with the attorney and the, the engineer. There's some additional copies up here. But it's on the it's on the computer too. So I'll just go through this really quickly. And what we were frustrated with, Mike has shared this many times as well. But we were frustrated with the um, lack of uh, the focused approach that we use in the watershed, and that's prioritized, targeted, and measurable. Um, that is an outline that Bowser had put out um, initially, guidance document that they wanted to have all of these plans follow. And so it's been very frustrating um, the last several months of seeing finally uh, some information that would pull it together for the policy committee. And uh, we're now coming down to the wire on how to structure going forward. This approach has not been talked about um, and not been presented. And so uh, we felt it important to bring it up at the last meeting last month. And uh, those three pages that I initially had together, uh, we showed at that meeting, talked about doing this, um, what we thought would be a, a good way to approach it since our district is both in the metro and out of the metro. You can go to the next, the next page. And then you can just follow along here. I'm not going to read all of these things. But we basically looked through the statutes to see what can be done. Um, pro the problem is that uh, Bowser has made this a directive for all of these um, hydrologic unit eight uh, categories. There's 81 of them in the, in the state. And they, uh, of course, were worried about the outstate areas that don't have watershed districts and how are they going to do that. And um, they didn't give any guidance, though, really, on how to pull all of these entities together. And so everybody's sort of fumbling around and working with uh, a joint powers agreement structure that exists in law. And so doing um, this approach, of course, this is just an outline of how districts work. Obviously, it's very brief. And our method would be going through the 103B.211. I think I'm quoting that correctly. And that's the joint powers watershed management organization. And that allows a district that has some of their territory in the metro and some of it outside of the metro to pull underneath that consolidated management of the metro area. Chuck will straighten me out if I say something incorrectly. But uh, basically, this is the outline of how a district would work. And they're working in all of these different areas uh, at the same time. Obviously, there's an engineer involved. And we thought that was important. Go to the next one, please. And so this would be a joint powers, Lower St. Croix basin-wide WMO. So it's not the local WMOs that we see now. It's an overlay to those existing structures and the local government units. And something else came up uh, while we were doing our research, and that is under the joint powers statute entities have to have similar powers in order to have the agreement. 
and watershed, uh, excuse me, um, uh, water conservation districts do not have budget authority and levy authority. They can prepare a budget, but the county has to approve it, and they can't levy, and so the county has to levy on their behalf. And so that was a big deal. So we're, we're going down this road where the soil and water conservation people play an equal role and maybe even a dominant one in this creation that's moving forward. And when you can't have them signed, um, they can't sign on the agreement, they can't sit on the board of the entity that's created, the Joint Powers Committee. So we thought that was a real problem, and we needed to address that quickly. So move to the next page. The functional outline, um, this gives just a kind of a, our vision of how we see this working. During the setup phase, we were proposing that Comfort Lake, Forest Lake uh, be that oversight so that we're making sure that it's formulated in the watershed way. And then uh, staff, of course, administrator would be hired eventually. The Joint Powers WMO board members would include representatives from each county, each watershed district, and each water management organization, or WMO, in the existing Lower St. Croix area. Um, the seats would be determined not by the way that the uh, agreement was presented, which is um, uh, the counties, you know, or the land area of the entities, I mean. And the county then, uh, Chisago County is the biggest at 47, I believe, percent land area. The SWCD would also then have that equal seating at the board as the counties do. So we thought that was, you know, Chuck actually, you know, said it correctly, which is they're double representing the issue because obviously the uh, county um, makes the decisions for the SWCDs. So that changes the structure so that you have people who can budget and can levy independently sitting on those decision-making uh, boards. Um, however, the joint WMO, of course, could uh, and should and will um, contract with the SWCDs, engineering firms, and other technical and water science-based entities as needed, just like we do now. County Ditch Authority, um, we're not proposing that that happen right away, but the law says that um, for those within the Lower St. Croix WMO boundaries, if the counties decide to transfer those, then the district has to take them. And I'm not, I don't think we've talked about this real fine point if the Joint Powers WMO, because it functions like a district, uh, would, would have that uh, must um, quality as well. So we'll go to the next one. Um, there's the 103B211 reference. It inherently meets the requirements of the One Watershed, One Plan legislation, which is all about access to clean water funds. And this is what it's all about, is that Bowser did not want to continue to have competitive grants, and they didn't want to continue to have to make decisions on a statewide basis and they wanted it done on these uh, Hawk 8 uh, groups. And so they, as I said, in guidance, uh, wanted these to be science-based following the PTM structure, water quality and quantity focused, a multiple year basis. Some guidance says, you know, multiple years, some say five, um, 10 years, of course, is the watershed way, so that's what, what I put in here. Um, obviously approved by Bowser, and we have to get this whole thing approved by Bowser and then uh, implementation based. So we get started and we're ready to implement because we also not only consulted with Chuck and we have uh, copies of these memos here to hand out to you for reading later, but uh, we also contracted um, or contacted our engineers and we wanted them to do a review of the existing studies that have been done. Uh, there's like 15 of them, I think, going back 10 or 12 years, but there've been some really um, uh, more focused ones in the last 10 years. And so it's looking at those studies and does that give us enough information to do an implementation plan? And they do. And so instead of fumbling around again with this um, very unwieldy plan with little focus, uh, we are ready to go out of the gate basically with what's already been done. 
And the um, Joint Powers Agreement, which is actually under a different statute, 471.59, uh, that would be uh, the document, of course, that lays out how uh, the governance portion of this works. Um, legal review, like I said, is underway. There's a memo to share it with you tonight, and uh, I, I would imagine that's going to be an ongoing thing. Next page, please. Um, I just did a table here that showed graphically what we've been talking about, and so uh, it's the difference under statutory authority between water management organizations, watershed districts, SWCDs, and then a new thing that came up in the last couple of weeks is the Lake Improvement District over in Chisago County for Green Lake, Chisago, and I think it's Center, or Lindstrom Lakes, and they've done good work. There's no question that they, that this allows for good work, it does, but it doesn't have any statutory independent authority. It's subordinate to the county. Mm -hmm. So next. So from concept, which is this is, is a concept to projects. This is sort of just a really quick overview um, of how we see this working. We get the approval of the concept by both major counties, which happen to be, of course, the counties that are make up the uh, Comfort Lake Forest Lake Watershed District. And the first one um, I went to was Chisago two weeks ago. And uh, it started out kind of rough, but, um, but it got very uh, 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 much uh, different than that as we moved along. And they started understanding uh, what we were trying to uh, get across here. And, um, and there was support for this when I left that Chisago County meeting. Now, a week later, <laughs> Mike heard from one of the participants who was the most active in, um, in talking about this, positively, apparently changed his mind. And, uh, and so that was one of the SWCD guys. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, last, or, or excuse me, this Tuesday, this past Tuesday, was uh, the Washington County meeting. The Chisago was a work group, very informal. And like our work groups, our, our work meetings, uh, this was a formal meeting. And there must have been 20 or 25 people in the room. So a lot of SWCD representation, uh, almost every uh, department at Washington County that had anything to do with this, including the legal folks, were in that meeting. Um, the full board was there. And so we had an opportunity to talk very briefly about this. Um, this slide deck that you're seeing was handed out to them the day before so that everybody could look at it and weigh in on it. Um, and the uh, Chisago County folks were very much in favor of an entity structure. The Washington County folks were more uh, in favor of not creating a separate entity but doing a collaboration. And at our last policy committee meeting last month, the end of last month, um, folks uh, were really um, talking about the problems of that kind of a collaborative. You, there's 15 different entities. And so to make decisions, you would have to go back to all 15 and have consensus. And you know they saw that as being problematic. Uh, and that was the most vocal. Uh, Mike was there too. Were you there at that meeting? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. You sat next to me. Um, so Mike can share some more insights um, as well, but um, it started out uh, kind of a mixed thing, more on the collaboration side, but then some of the more vocal against collaboration came out at the end. And so there was, there was again, showing that gap, that hole, mm -hmm. where nothing that had been talked about up to that date um, had really fit the bill for both. And we think that this also, one of the pluses to this is that we pull in Chisago County, and instead of having a separate pot of money for the metro and a separate pot of money for the outstate area, <coughs> that would all be combined under this, this overlay WMO. And uh, then projects are funded based on uh, the watershed district criteria, which is the higher contribution sources. And we also explained that we're not uh, proposing that this take the place of anyone's local plan because, because we felt that the local plans are very important to stay in place. Um, but 
it looks at it from that basin wide area. And so the uh, common thing, of course, is the conveyance system, the river system, and that's the Sunrise River, which is the largest contribution source of phosphorus to the lower St. Croix. And uh, it's fourth, if you count the, the Wisconsin side, there's three rivers on, in the Wisconsin side above us, but we are the number one from the Minnesota side. And I think that should be the last one. Um, now here we go, this is where we're talking about the uh, ability to look at these prior reports, and particularly that Army Corps of Engineering study done by, <coughs> or uh, commissioned by Chisago County, uh, points to these hot spots, or, uh, and there's some data, we might have to do some monitoring to f flesh it out, but, uh, but we're ready to take action, and um, Mike can probably address this better from his planning um, uh, meetings that he goes to, committee meetings, but their, uh, their plan was not accepted by Bowser. It was rejected for not being prioritized, targeted, and measurable. The, one, the lower St. Croix plan? Yeah, oh, you got that, okay. Do you have that? Uh, yep, yeah. And this is the technical memo that um, Megan uh, produced, and so you can, I think that X there that's highlighted is um, she needs to get a copy, of, or, I mean a count of the actual number of studies, but, but other than that, um, the um, sediment loading and phosphorus loading charts are, are produced here. There is, I think, on... Uh, no, I guess that's not, that's not the one. Um, there is a, a, she's working on another memo, memo, excuse me, that has the um, charts from that uh, Army Corps project that lists the different lakes, of course, that have the highest contribution sources and the tributaries. So we, we'll be looking from that. But this is a nice overview of some of that great data that comes out of those existing reports. And to my understanding from my understanding the um, the current plan that's being done uh, hasn't utilized any of that information they're, I know they're using information from the local input sources but none of these studies that have been done none of the studies that made up this memo. yeah yeah, so we found that to be troubling, mm. obviously. What I'm passing around now is um, the, uh, this is attorney-client status. I think, can we talk about that openly, or do we have to close session? Because this is a, um, a can, do we have to waive Mr. privilege President, or something? Andrew Anderson, yeah. um, it's, a, it's a privileged document, so a uh, question for the board is whether you choose to, to waive the privilege and it would be a public document uh, or not. You, any discussion about it is open session okay. discussion. Okay. Um, so if you decide not to waive it, you would, you would be best advised to have your discussion without explicitly talking about okay. the memo itself. Um, all so, right. So. Well, that makes it very difficult. So I, I, don't, I don't think there's anything terribly sensitive in here other than we might upset people who are thinking about a different, different, different of, approach. Well, and I did, I did distribute to uh, all the managers um, early in, earlier this week. Okay. Uh, so you've had a chance to read it. it um, it's not, uh, I don't know that there's something sensitive in it. It, it goes through the, the multiple uh, considerations in, in establishing this type of framework. It does note uh, several areas where there are questions or items that need to be worked through uh, to get to the end goal. Okay. So there is one point I wanted to bring up to the board um, that Chuck brought out, and it is a potential Excuse issue. Me. Oh, oh, we have That's to either. So I'm just asking whether oh. the board oh. wants to waive, wants the to waive the, the privilege on yeah. it. I, I agree. I don't think there's anything sensitive in here. I, I, would, I would feel like we could waive the attorney-client uh, privilege on this document. I would agree. So do we need a motion for that? Um, 
You don't need to if it's if that's the basically the unanimous consent that's indicated in the minutes. Consent. Do you have any issues, uh, Jim or Jen? No. Nope. All right. Yeah, Wait. it's hard to have a discussion without without uh, yeah. being able to talk about it. So. Again, uh, everything that I talked about during that presentation is in here, of course, in more detail. So um, please take uh, some time to read this uh, after the meeting. I, I'd like to have this on a, we might even want to call a special meeting, John, uh, if it depends on how the meeting goes on Monday. Um, okay. We might not want to wait until the 12th because there is blowback to this, as you can imagine. And we're telling SWCDs that they just, don't have the authority to do, to do what they've been doing. I mean, they can participate, of course, but but they can't sit on the on the at the table, if you will. Um, but there is one section here, even though under one one hundred three b point two one one, that's on page two. If you look at that area, you'll see. Um, trying to, oh, here we go on the second page. You'll see 103D listed several times, and these are the authorities under the uh, Watershed District 103D um, section. It starts there, but uh, the ability to levy and to, that's on page five, uh, to budget, adopt a budget on your own, to certify the levy to the auditor on your own, uh, that's all uh, respons direct responsibility under current statute. There is, however, at the very end of page five, those last two paragraphs, um, where Chuck is talking about um, this different authorization to the uh, commissioner of revenue under 275.066. Um, there is a listing of the different types of special taxing districts in the state. Number one is watershed districts. Number 26 is this any other political subdivision of the state of Minnesota that has the power to adopt and certify a property tax levy to the county auditor. And then we have this little phrase at the end, as determined by the Commissioner of Revenue. And according to Chuck, um, the only entity uh, that was known to be listed there was, which one? I forget. Well, the only joint powers WMO yeah. is yeah. The, the Mississippi That's right. WMO. Right. But then looking at the list for um, coming up, I think it was 2019 or, or possibly even the one for 2020 coming up, there are six different organizations. Under WMO. this one. Yeah, under that one. And so a couple of them are counties, you know, but, but there are some that uh, either got that special recognition or kind of breeze through. I don't know yet. I did make a call to the Commissioner of Revenue's office this afternoon, though, just to see what the protocol really is, and um, and they're going to call me back tomorrow. Okay. So I'll know more in a day or two, but um, hopefully before the meeting um, on Monday at 4. But Chuck did a really thorough job, as usual, um, in outlining uh, what he considered to be the issues um, that we might run into, but also bottom line is that it is possible to do this. So we feel pretty solid, 95% anyway, and still waiting on that commissioner of revenue okay. item. And then, um, but we feel comfortable continuing to talk about that. Uh, the last uh, document that I'm going to share here is um, an email from uh, Melissa Lewis from Bowser. There was a series of emails, of course, that generated after this PowerPoint came out. And I hope there's enough copies here. Three, four, five, that should be enough. Um, there will be some extras at the end of the meeting. If, yeah, make sure that you guys walk out with a full set. Um, and and you, again, these are things that she's pointing out that she thinks needs to be flushed out. I'm going to be working on this over the weekend, um, taking her advice and then, and then um, uh, fleshing out what needs to be fleshed out. But she was concerned also about that issue about the taxation. And there was a court case apparently a number of years ago, and um, she feels that that's not uh, able to happen because of that court case, but um, 
Chuck brought that up as well. Mm -hmm. And when I read the statute, I saw a word there. I didn't really, I think I knew it, but I hadn't used it in a long, long time. So I looked it up. <laughs> and the statute uses a term called coterminous. <coughs> and that means a entity with a shared border. I mean, there's several different things, but that basically means that. And I equate it to the, to make it easier to understand, uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota have coterminous borders. But Minnesota is conterminous with the United States. So it's part of this bigger underlying or overlying uh, construct, and that's what we're looking at. We're looking at providing a construct for the Huck 8 group, the major watershed group, that Bowser has not provided. Now, supporting that position is that this whole move to Huck 8 major watershed management occurred in 1977. The legislature had charged the uh, Department of Natural Resources with coming up with a map um, that um, managed the water on these Huck 8 levels. And so that map was, was uh, put into statute in 1977. The MPCA adopted that management style somewhere in the early 70s, probably close to the Clean Water Act, is my guess, but who knows. Um, but these, these entities are all part of the water laws of Minnesota. And so all of these other agencies have adopted this structure Bowser never did, until forced, I think, by the legislature again. And so um, that's what we've been dealing with now the last several years, is this move with this agency toward the same management, uh, larger management. Uh, and it's all based around the river systems. Minnesota is very unique in that we have, I think it's four uh, major rivers that start in Minnesota, and Mississippi is only one of them. We right. hear about that all the time. Right. But um, <clears throat> the Huck 8 level is the river systems that are tributary to these major rivers. And so there are 81 in the state of Minnesota, and Bowser has been primarily worried about the outstate uh, folks where money hasn't been flowing from the Clean Water Fund. But, um, you know, Doug Thomas used to be our our administrator here, and he was hired back by Bowser to uh, get this program off the ground. And you had talks with him, I know I, I did yep. too, and at, at MOD for several years, and the point was is to, um, they weren't showing much progress in outstate, and so they needed a mechanism to get those dollars flowing to the outstate areas, and uh, they really didn't know how to do it. Uh, what they knew is that you have SWCDs in every county, but that sort of degrades the whole point of watershed districts, which is bounded by water boundaries, not political boundaries. And I think we're in that cauldron right now, that struggle between how to maintain a watershed focus, but you're putting things into a political boundary, a political construct. So we're trying to break that mold and keep it in the watershed area. And so, you know, whenever you try to do something different or new, there's lots of pushback and lots of animosity. And so I'm stealing myself up for a good meeting on Monday. But uh, the board needs to give approval to continue with this process because we're at a critical juncture right now. This board. This board, this board. Because if we don't like the outcome, one of our options is to withdraw from the process. Is that true? I think that's a really good way to start, is that we've been back and forth over the last couple of years about whether this is worthwhile or not. It certainly takes up a lot of time of staff. It takes up a lot of time, Steve and I. Um, and you've got to do a lot of research, of course, to get ready for the meetings and uh, understand uh, what's not being talked about. You know, that's pretty obvious. When you come from the watershed district management style, 
and then you go to these meetings. It's, um, it's, it's very, very different. And I'd like, if Mike would, just give a little recount of what Bowser uh, told the planning committee um, recently, and uh, last month, I believe. And I think there's a lot of sensitivity right now because we're coming what they look at as uh, out of the blue with this uh, new proposal and doing an end run around their, their activities. But we've talked about this now for the last four months. So there's no end run. It's not an end run. No. But it, Mike, if you would share what Bowser. Sure. Um, Mr. President and Managers, so I've been participating in the planning team. Um, meetings and that's comprised of the five SWCDs and then in two watershed districts um, the one is fairly infrequent uh, in attendance and and I'll be honest it's been difficult I guess as much mentally to participate because it's been um, they're, they're, they've been quite opposed to the prioritized targeted and measurable piece that that we under operate under um, and even with giving a presentation to the policy committee um, in um, August, and I think that I presented to the uh, planning team meeting uh, something you know, along this line showing the need to be prioritized, targeted, and measurable because they were on a track to need another billion dollars to do the work and we're likely to maybe receive about ten million dollars over ten years. So I'm saying like how are you how are you going to do this folks? You know, so um, but this was largely brushed aside and, and we've just continued. And what became very clear, I mean they were very they had no problem vocalizing this at these planning team meetings now uh, in the last couple of sessions here uh, since the first of the month is that their number one priority is having money come in to keep staff. And then they want to have, uh, they want to fund programs. They have, they do not need any money for projects because they can get it all, all the, seemingly all the money they want through federal programs. So, uh, and, and then, you know, out of fairness to the SWCDs and then them describing the need, what they need out of 103C from their standpoint is that they're just not wired, so to speak, to do watershed management work. So they have all this other work that they need to be working on and to be responsible to the citizens of the counties, you know, so um, that they, uh, they occupy. So I, I don't take that away from them. I don't take away a, a lot of the good work that they're doing. Um, but I think this really is a case where, where they've, you know, it's a square peg trying to be shoved into a round hole uh, from that standpoint. And so, uh, yeah, so Bowser just came in a couple of meetings early in, in November and just said, well, they asked for the meeting, in fact, and they said, so after basically a year and a half, this plan that they had largely formulated, they said, it's not prioritized, it's not targeted, and there's no measurability. They said, we will not approve this plan. So they talked about then how to basically dance, do the dance to get still what they needed, which is kind of frustrating because you're in the spirit of things, you're still not trying to address really the piece of it. So, um, you know, one thing for me then that's become clear over the last couple of weeks is that really it, it would seem that what Bowser's intent was, and certainly what the intent of the Clean Water Fund was to, you know, is for terms of cleaning up the lakes. I mean, it would be much better to use these funds um, for the legacy load activities and for the and for the SWCDs and to continue their good work in addressing the current incoming loads off the egg, which we know is a large piece of it. But uh, with that, just uh, just earlier in the week, I've been trying to meet with uh, Jeff Forster from the Rivers Lakes and um, uh, Rivers and Lakes Advocates uh, Associate or organization, they're a nonprofit. Um, and he invited me today to a meeting um, on civic governance that they've been involved with on, on two, uh, two different, one watershed, one plan uh, efforts. And, and if you flip over, you'll see um, on the top piece there, a couple different 
um, smaller blue circles. So one is this interstate, one is uh, Minnesota St. Croix, and then Minnesota Lakes and Rivers, which is that organization. But it just happens in that the Minnesota St. Croix, this is uh, Malak and Kanabic SDB CDs. And so these people were there and I had a chance to talk with them some afterwards and um, and and they and they were involved with another one watershed one plant which involves two of the same SWCDs that we're at. And they expressed their frustration that they could not get their counterparts to buy into this because what's happening on the interstate, which is the Wisconsin side, so they've been having this active farm, you know, level community. So they're really engaging the farm community. I'll I'll note that we've had one meeting in a year and a half with our public because everybody decided for the public that they're all meeting doubt that we didn't need to get more citizen input. We can do something online and that's good enough. Um, but on the interstate side, so they're, and, or both of them, they said they're, they're, they're seeing results. Farmers are implementing practices because they're, they're saying, how do, how do you want to solve this problem? You know, so they're engaging them from a civic governance standpoint. And so, and, and they have no money to offer them. So they're, and yet these, as a community, the farmers are addressing their problems because they recognize also they're tying in the profitability. Mm -hmm. So for me then, given my farm ag background and agronomist background, and having worked for a conservation district for 12 years, it's frustrating to suggest that we're just gonna somehow come in and solve all the conservation problems for all of the, the farmers across the, the, the 136,000 acres of farmland in the, in the lower St. Croix. It's just not possible, and it's certainly not economically feasible. And in fact, by not working with them to improve their profitability and reducing these offsite impacts, it's a sort of a double negative, if you will, because we're not helping them achieve the, you know, that maximum point of profitability and then we're trying to come in with all this taxpayer money to solve a problem that really they could potentially solve on their own. Mm -hmm. So the legacy pieces are different. I mean, those, 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 are, those are things that are not going to garner them any additional benefit. It's something that's happened in a wetland. It's or, you know, an old cheese factory or something that was dumping or examples like that. Though that's where we come in and or these kind of efforts. But the other one is, is different. And so um, I, I was very encouraged by, by participating in this, and I would like to evaluate it further, um, not only for, if nothing else, just for the district to involve with our farm community, um, but certainly to try to encourage this group in the Lower St. Croix to take a more serious look at this in terms of engagement, um, because there's just no way we're going to have enough money to address the needs. And even the other SWCDs that were that I talked to today made that very same comment that they said we'll never have enough money to deal with all the egg stuff. Right. So we need to get we need farmers to solve their own problems, and we can help them with the technical stuff. And in and, and a lot of cases, they're showing that they can do that, and they want to. Yeah. You know, just need to you know give them some information. Sure. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Um, I did check uh, my email. This is the right one on page two. So this is the right updated memo. So this is the targeted list of um, uh, reductions that we need. Okay. okay, so we have this in reports already. Yeah. So this is in the Megan oh, memo from the, EOR. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was not the right one, but I missed that. It's on page two. So that is the updated one, the last one. There it is. And this was a big deal when I talked to Chisago. <coughs> Is that because they were all concerned about the m pot of money for out um, of metro area is 400 and some thousand, and the area in the metro um, pot is eight, almost 800,000. So they were very concerned about not being able to tap into that money. But this joint powers WMO, of course, like I said, brings it brings it uh, together. And then you're looking at prioritized projects that will get the money, not the counties and not the entity. It's it's where is the most impactful project. And this is the start of that. This came out of that Army Corps report. So again, um, there has been no mention of these at the policy committee meetings. Um, Mike's on the planning committee. Um, I don't think they've been referenced maybe 
Well, there's been some some gap analysis data, so they've. I, I'd have to double check to see if they've looked at yeah. them in in, in totality, um, but their focus is, has been different. Yeah. I mean, right now they're so they're coming up with a revised list, and I think we're now at instead of a hundred and some lakes to prioritize, we're now down to like 28, which again, that's mm -hmm. in our realm that would not yeah. fly. Yeah. You know. So anyway, um, it's it's a struggle. It's mm -hmm. it's, um, it's a fight. Um, not fun, <laughs> um, you know. But it's uh, you have a sense of purpose. Yep. You know, you have a sense of purpose, and and as long as we're making headway toward the end goal, um, then it's it's a good thing, and and all that work and and. Uh, and all that kind of stuff that you have to get, and not you know, fist of, fist of cups, of course, <laughs> but but mental, the mental uh, fights that you have to be in all the time, um, is it's worth it if the end goal can be recognized, which is cleaning up the water, of course, and and um, particularly at this Huck Eight, it's the Sun, uh, excuse me, the Saint Croix, and while we all know this, while you focus on that major lake in our particular structure in our district. You're cleaning up all of these things. You're cleaning up wetlands. You're cleaning whatever the source of the contribution right. is. You're dealing with that, and so you don't have to separate out of these focused areas because you capture them all with that focused, broader look. And and we can't seem to, as Mike said, uh, there's there's a different way of thinking, and so you you can't get them easily to where you want them to be to see. Uh, to see how different it is when you do focus on that highest contribution. So, um, anyway, uh, the board needs to authorize Steve and I to, to continue, and we will come back, of course, every month with updates, and as you pointed out, um, there's always the opportunity to say, this is not worth our time and effort and energy. Sounds like it still is at this point, mm -hmm. but... We are maybe approaching the point in which we have to make that decision. Would that be correct? Yeah, I think I think that's true. If, if we can't get consensus right. that this is a better, but even to listen to it. Right now, we're having a difficult time having people even listen to it. Um, and so uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I mean, what is what is Bowser? I, I don't. Know. Yeah. Bowser's got to be just. <clears throat> bummed out by this whole Well, thing. the interesting thing to me is that, you know, from Mike's uh, relaying to us all these months, uh, Bowser has told him that they want this to function more like our district functions. Right. So we've attempted to do that, and, and we're getting, we're getting fallback. And I don't, think that, I don't think that Bowser's, at least our two contacts, Dan and, and Melissa, I don't think that they're against it. I think they were surprised by it, which again, I don't really fully understand that since we've talked about it at policy meetings before. And last month, like I said, even this three, four, three or four first pages of that presentation were presented mm. at the policy committee meeting. So mm. maybe they just weren't paying attention, who knows. But, um, but I, th I think, you know, people get into a rut and, and this is the way they think and that's the way they go and so you've got to really sort of shake them up in order to get them to, to look at things differently. And um, I don't know if Bowser is going to accept their redo of this plan. Yeah. But in the meantime, we're going to have an outline of a plan yeah. that says we can get some work done here right away. We don't have to wait six months to get write the, a new plan. to write a new plan. We've got the action plan ready to go. Okay. Well, I'm certainly in favor of continuing down the path that you're going down, and I know it's a lot of work, and if you're willing to keep at pushing on it, I don't know about the rest of the board. I'll second that. Sure. So, okay. I'll let Steve know. So, told you on. Yeah, okay. You said, you said that you were ready for a tough meeting on Monday. You didn't, yeah. you didn't mean a tough meeting. Right, you said. Be a tough beating. Yeah. <laughs> well, it might be that. It might turn but, into a tough beating, but starting out as I've a been meeting. A, I've been in a number of those in yeah. my life, so. <laughs> You're okay with it. You're, you're ready to take yeah. that on. Yeah. All right. Well, they're never fun. No, no, they're but, never fun. But um, I feel that we have 
uh, right on our side, mm -hmm. and so that gives me lots and lots of steel. Yeah. And um, I think that we're we're our, <clears throat> we're, we're not out to uh, diminish anything that anyone else is doing. Right. Uh, Mike said it. I've said it. You know, they do good work. LIDs do good work. Um, soil and water conservation folks do work good work. Absolutely. They just do it in a different way. Right. They have different statutory authorities. And those are the rules. Yep. I mean, if you're gonna sit down and play cards, you gotta know what the game is and what the what the rules are. And uh, so, as long as we stay that way, and as long as Bowser is committed, actually committed yeah. to what they put down in guidance, the then thing. then I think we're going to we're going to be just fine. Yeah, yeah. I think Bowser's got to be behind it. If, oh yeah. If Bowser falls away from it, then we're yeah. out because. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to be worth it to us to yeah. spend, to, to, to be ineffective. Yeah, Mike. Oh, oh Megan. Mr. President, I just, I just I want to, before we move on, clarify um, the, the two memos that were from me. Um, <clears throat> just some of the context. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Kinney, Manager Anderson, and Manager Smoltz and I uh, met and in support of these meetings that Manager Anderson and Manager Smolt have been attending for the One Water Citizen Plan. The first one that was actually in the board packet was was my understanding of a, a, a discussion we had and putting together this action plan going through, okay, this is how you would do the watershed management plan based on what the studies are. And then I received clarification from Manager Anderson um, that it would be useful for these meetings to actually go through this motions, go through the steps, what what would it look like? And that's the that's the memo that manager Anderson handed out okay. but if you'll notice it was it was I was pulling as much information as I could quickly in preparation for a meeting so right. it's not complete you'll know some yet. hanging right. and right. So this really isn't a public document this would be just for internal <coughs> board right. use it's in these discussions so you have the the science and the yeah. technical data to support yeah. what you're saying well, just want to clarify thank, that. thank you for doing that there is one more thing I have to ask the board for um, because as she just said this is a, a working document and this was meant for your your consideration. Uh, the same is true with the legal uh, document. Uh, that is a attorney client memorandum. Not anymore. Not anymore <laughs> but uh, it's also uh, to share it with the wider public. Um, I think Chuck, you wanted to uh, revise this down into maybe not as much detail. Did I understand that correctly? Um, Mr. Chair and uh, Madre Anderson, not not necessarily the the. The one simple thing that would be necessary would be to remove the attorney-client okay. designation. Um, I did, in preparing this draft, go through to consider whether there was anything written that was sensitive to an external audience, and then to kind of massage it accordingly. But mm -hmm. apart from the fact that you know it's nine pages long, um, I don't know that there's anything more to be done to it. Okay. okay. So uh, then again, uh, if I have uh, both lawyers and the engineers and the board's approval to share uh, these two, number two memo from Megan, but um, this version from Chuck mm -hmm. with the policy committee on Monday? I would think there's some useful points in that mm -hmm. memo that you could use to back up our arguments. Right. And I think that's what the ultimate goal is, is mm -hmm. to back up our arguments. Right. So I know that your memo is not complete as it presented, and we will fill in the information as necessary, but it's not necessary for Monday's meeting no. to have all that detail. Mm -hmm. But it is a preliminary document, so as long as that's understood, and there mm -hmm. will be more work done. Uh, if I could ask if, if this gets brought somewhere and somebody else be on the board, I'd like to put maybe just like a draft watermark or something sure. to <laughs> maybe make that a little clearer. Yeah. And then I could send it. Yeah, that's again. fine. Just okay. send it to me when you're okay. done. Okay. That sounds good. And if, you, and if you have that number of reports. <laughs> yeah, I can do that tally. Yeah. yeah. You could do that tally. Remove that X. Otherwise, yeah. I think okay. the point of it was to show them how using available yeah. data right. can get you to an action plan. Can move you very quickly. quickly. Yeah. Since so the data's already been collected. We set, we set up our entity and we engage right. from day one. Good. Okay. Oh, Chuck. Just if I can offer one more thought that may be useful um, in making progress with, with Bowser on this, which is <coughs> um, the, the fundamental issue here is that we have this new program at the Huck 8 scale. Um, 
and there was a kind of a structure to do the planning, but there's no structure to do the implementation. So um, the district is taking the lead in creatively improvising a structure from the existing tools in the statutes. Um, one thing to note is that the, the use of the JPWMO here is something that the district can try to do because of the fortuity that uh, by the statute the JPWMO is, a, is available when some or all of the area is within the metro area, which means that even if the district can pioneer the use of this, it still isn't something that can be used by all the outstate uh, 1WMP organizations. So even if you know a beautiful creative product is create is is produced here, it's not it's not a tool for everyone else. Um, and so my thought is simply that. Um, I'm wondering if it may be helpful to posture this to, to, to Bowser along the lines of, we know this isn't perfect, but it's kind of a pilot effort, and that ultimately, if it's successful, the next step would be legislation that would create a cleaner, similar organization, but wouldn't be limited to the metro area and would actually be something that would be useful for Yes, and, and that's yeah, and that has been part of our communication back and forth with sure. uh, Chuck and and Steve and I, and um, and that is step two. Right. But you know we need to focus on step one step right one, now. Right. At least and pilot it. Right. It get piloted and and get it moving, and then again that <coughs> history of how Huck Eight uh, concept <coughs> has been introduced in statute in these different areas, and how long it's been around. Uh, helps because uh, you know all the data collection is at that Huck Eight level now, right. except for Bowser. So it, it's a it's a good I think tool to use to get to that second step of legislation for all of the other areas because it is different. We we have the advantage of having lived under 103D for our first seven or eight years, and it is not easy. Cool. So, the, the, you know, what we can do to help the outstate, we have some inside information about that. Nice. Nice. Okay, anything else on this topic? All right, we have the 2020 budget and tax impact memo. Mr. President and managers, I know that a couple of you have had a little um, additional input or feedback on that, but this was requested uh, by the board to bring this back. Um, and uh, I guess it's a little bit of how you slice things, but yeah. if there's any further discussion. I think the key thing is to have a, a, a vehicle to be able to show people when they actually see their tax bill, well, what, well how this happened. What, didn't think you raised the levy that much. We didn't. We actually thought we were going to lower. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah, I, I think it's important to have it accurate for that very reason, so that we, when we share it, we know that the math is right. It just didn't look right the first time, and there were the explanation is in the memo yeah. on why that happened. It's the way that local versus the state used 2019 and 2020 data. The other thing that I just wanted to share is that um, when you actually take the dollar amount of our levy increase against the increase of the tax capacity, you end up with an effective rate of about a point to a point and a half lower than what's shown here. And so that's always very important to understand. And so for next year, um, if we can just add that effective rate, uh, then that equalizes the tax levy against the increased tax capacity. Yeah. Yeah. But I think this is a good memo. Yeah, I think I think captures all the important mm -hmm. information. It's just um, you know, interpreting the information as p other people mm -hmm. view it and making sure we understand it all. So. Right. Well, I just want to make sure um, the board knows give Emily credit. She did a lot of additional research and mm -hmm. calling two counties and, and getting them even on the same page. And, and I was in on, on one of those conference calls with, with the Washington County folks as well. And 
So, yeah, a lot of, in fact, they even had to go back and kind of double check a few things themselves. So, um, yeah, it was, and part of it, I guess, is this even when, uh, what Emily relayed back, um, <clears throat> I think to Manager Anderson and I at one point was that even the Department of Revenue just says, yeah, good luck, basically. This is, Minnesota has some of the most complicated property tax formulas in the country. Yeah. So. I can't imagine. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> yep. All I know is they never go down. So that's all I know. All right. So reports of staff. Mike, anything or anybody have questions for Mike on his report? Anything you wanted to highlight or? Well, just on, from a board administration standpoint, I guess I would like to request that um, because a couple of the managers have asked about year rent submittals for um, reimbursements and things, and we don't really have a well-defined policy. Um, and um, I don't know that you've, in particular, Mr. Uh, Manager Spence, have asked about it. So, uh, if the board wants to take that up, we can. Otherwise, I can. I mean, one of the things is like I can go and ask other districts, maybe just in Washington County, but um, I guess I just wanted to get a sense or if, of, of what that might look like. But I know, you know, the managers, Manager Smaltz, Manager Anderson have just been putting in an extraordinary amount of time on this one watershed, one plan piece, and I want to make sure that that's being recognized as well. So, um, uh, Yeah, I mean, I, I struggle with even submitting an expense report for some, most of the things that I do, but I know these two have been burning the candle at both ends. So, I, I, yeah, if there's some guidance out there about, you know, what would be considered a, a daily um, amount and, uh, you know, those types of things, that'd be great. I, I've just been getting reimbursed for these meetings, right, these regular meetings. I haven't been getting reimbursed for the pre preparation time, even though we approved that and all that other stuff. So. It's honestly something I just haven't dealt with, and so if there's anything that we could do to clarify those points, that would be helpful. We do have a policy on that. Oh, I, we passed I, it this year. Yeah, I know. And so, and so it is when you're doing uh, non-meeting stuff, for okay. example, um, it's an aggregation of that time up to four hours. And so whenever you reach that four hours, you know, you're doing, you're doing that, that's a submittal point. That's what we, we decided on. And we also extended the, uh, we, we have a really harsh 30-day, uh, 60 days, I think it is 60 days from, from occurrence. But we waived that this year because the policy was new. Um, and I was looking at the uh, Rice Creek uh, Watershed District Governance Manual. Not too many people have those, but um, but they do, and they have a um, end of year, which I, I like because it's very difficult to do a year of end or end of year. I mean, um, they have to submit by February first any remaining expenses for the entire year, so it's not limited to just December; it's the entire prior year. Mm. And um, as we talked about earlier this year, um, you know, this this is. Uh, a position that people take because they want to do good work for their community. There's no question about that. But that doesn't mean that they don't have the right to submit their expense reports according to our rules. And uh, we have time limits on them right now, 60 days. Uh, we did get the um, pay, which used to be quarterly, now on a monthly basis. So. That's a little bit more incentive for people to get expense reports in on time. Um, but uh, I struggled with this in business, uh, and, and especially with field sales reps, you know, getting, getting expense reports in. So you don't want to not pay them for their, for their time, but you want to always have those guides in place so that it's done timely. And so, um, so I think the, the rules are fine for me. Um, Doing the documentation, I did submit a expense report for the first time in 17 years, other than the mod <laughs> meeting, and so uh, this year was particularly uh, difficult uh, because there was a lot of intensive.
projects that we were working on. And that doesn't even include the Lower St. Croix stuff. I haven't submitted anything on that. But just to give you an idea, just these last two and a half, three weeks, because of the intensity of this, um, it's 50 hours. Mm -hmm. And most of that is on weekends where, you know, there's not a lot going on. And so you work, well, I work that way. I get involved in a project and I can do 16 hours, you know, at a crack. And, and so that's what happens. So in two days, you've got 30 hours built up already. Mm -hmm. But um, but it's that intensive. Mm. Well, I'm glad I'm not doing that. But I'm glad you are. <laughs> <laughs> so getting that uh, detail is, I think, the important thing. Which, uh, of course, I have all of that on uh, uh, like this. I carry this stuff around so that I can write down my time and so on. But for the building, for example, you know, there were a lot of 15, 20 minute conversations sure. on the phone in person, you're out you know, looking at things, it doesn't add up, right. doesn't aggregate to that four hours. Right. And the meetings are part of that. So if you have a meeting, which we did several times, uh, with Mike, uh, Steve and I together, and sometimes with the building owner, uh, they might be half an hour, 45 minute meetings. Uh, rarely did they go over an hour. Mm -hmm. And so you just write all of that down and, and you mm -hmm. put it together when you get around to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's the issue. Well, first, the issue is writing it down. Second, yeah. it's aggregating it. Yeah. So anyway, that's, I, th I think our policy is good. You know, we've worked on it for a very, very long yeah. time. I think the timeliness of it is, uh, is the issue and, and uh, making sure that that documentation is in. Um, but again, Rice Creek uh, has a carryover into the next year, which I think is is the right thing to do. Does that affect our accounting? No, usually accounting in, the, in January, as long as it comes in in that January period, it's allocated back to the prior year. And so you don't close out your books typically until-, until End of January. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, early right. February. As long early as it February, doesn't have an accounting. Actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Well, I will review the policy and uh, Reacquaint myself. I know we worked on it. I obviously yeah. know we we changed it. So I, I do think that we should we should uh, adopt the uh, portion of the Rice Creek one that I just talked about, carrying it over into the next year. That, that seems like a good business decision to me. We have to look at those, or we're supposed to look at our governance documents every year just to see if they need tweaking, and mm -hmm. and I think that would be a good one. So sometime in the. Be Next year, yeah. we, we should re-review that and bring that mm -hmm. to our, okay. Yeah, I think so. All right. Any other comments? Um, so now that uh, Wayne has finally officially <laughs> become not a member of our board, <laughs> does that mean we get to uh, award him or reward him officially? Because we kind of unofficially did it, but... I think it would be nice to do it officially at one of our future meetings, either January, February, maybe. Well, remember he withdrew on that um, watershed yeah, champion I, piece, I, you know, so on. But he wasn't officially off the board yet at that point. Correct. But he was never given right. you know, that recognition at that right. time. No, I, I, think, I, think, uh, I think that, uh, well, that was a board meeting. And that was a public board meeting where a lot more people attend than a regular <laughs> board meeting. <laughs> but what I do think is that, so I, so I think that that, cer that certificate of appreciation that he got or, or whatever it ended up being called, but, but I think that that was the, what we had in mind. But, but I do think that we need to do a letter from the board yeah. thanking him for his service. And I think that's sometimes more impactful than... than um, the certificate or the, very or the plaque. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, I do. Yeah, so maybe we can pull something together and mm -hmm. get something out to him. Uh, it, it, we were on the administrator report, mm -hmm. and yep. I just I just had um, one question on page um, three. Uh, actually, two. There's another question on the other side. But on <laughs> number uh, three. The last under 3006, um, you had the meeting with the locals about uh, um, Forest Lake, I mean, um, about 
commercial parking and snow removal. Uh, did you talk to them about that uh, county ditch <coughs> issue? Um, only from the standpoint that every they said, yes, we know it's an issue. Okay. Um, so, but I guess the one thing that has, has come up is, and we actually I think there was some conversation with the MPCA on this is um, that even they hadn't considered, but I think the engineer brought this forth was the fact that um, when they're doing this and then it's not being it's not being treated by our stormwater features, you know, so they're really it's a way to sort of bypass the whole stormwater component of it. So, um, so, so it's now uh, at the, you know, at least at the attention of the MPCA sort of MS4 group, if you will, some of their staff. Um, and there's an RFP right now for some other research for, and I think I just sent something over to Dr. Funky about maybe, maybe that being a research, potential research item because um, I'm sure it's a, it's, uh, you know, all over the place. I mean, so it's a, it's a common problem. You know, how much, how much of this is being, you know, sort of bypassing these facilities mm -hmm. um, through these means. Yeah, and in our particular case, uh, this this county line is not the one that goes through the uh, Ducharme property. It's the one on Highway Eight Correct. as you're going east. And the businesses from both sides of the ditch push their snow into that ditch to the point of, especially on a high snow year, of blocking it almost. And, I mean, it's just the snow is way above the, the fence line even. So that's happening there. And then um, uh, Dick Damchuk used to bring up, of course, the, the um, uh, exit from Forest Lake by the apartment buildings and that parking lot. Uh, was always uh, dumping and, and pushing their snow into that channel. Right. So that's a clean water violation. I mean, there, there typically are ordinances that prohibit that kind of thing from happening. Um, so I would just ask the cities to look at their ordinances uh, to see if there's a prohibition about, about that kind of snow dumping. <coughs> Most cities have them. Um, and then on the last page, page six, uh, there was a mention under the Lower St. Croix <clears throat> One Watershed, One Plan that Emily has been helping Laura uh, write uh, some sections of the plan. Of course, at Laura's direction, I would imagine. And so um, I just wanted, wanted to know how extensive that assistance has been. Um, I could provide a copy of the staff budget and this is one of the few areas Jessica's got a few hours too but it's fairly minor most of the staff um, I'd have to check for sure but I think most most of the SWCD staff are getting reimbursed for their time and, mm -hmm. and on the plan different form and functions um, and I think the contract constitutes maybe about half of it for the with the contractor but the rest of it then goes to the SWCD staff. I think there's like 30 hours or something maybe allocated to Emily. Yeah. Um, and then a smaller amount for Jessica just for doing the website and things like that. And I, I wasn't curious from that standpoint. I was curious on how much involvement she actually has. And, and I'm sure that Delora is telling her what to do and you know, how to gather the information. That's my point. Right. And it, yeah. right. I, I had hoped that we would, we would, by being involved, we would have more mm -hmm. input on it. But... This now is so late in the game. Mm -hmm. The structure of the plan is already decided. Yeah. yeah, you know, so it's. I just wondered if they gave her an opportunity to provide some input, or if they, she's just following through on what she's given. I think she's largely being directed. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's kind of what I guessed. So, all right, thank you. Okay. E O R. Unless there's no other questions for Mike. No. E O R. I'll just add briefly, um, the shield reuse system is fully winterized, so it's offline for the season. And then the, the uh, bank stabilization has been completed, so Kyle oversaw the completion of that. So. All right. Smith Partners. Anything, Chuck? Nothing, Mr. Chair. All right. 
since our treasurer is not here and our assistant treasurer is no longer with the board, I will deliver the treasurer's report this evening. What you have in your packet, we have income for the period of $20,791.45, expenses for $356,608.80, and at this time I would ask for your approval of the treasurer's report and approval to pay the bills. So moved. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We're looking pretty good. Yeah, we've got money. Mm -hmm. Well, the big one's coming in December, so that's good. Right. That should right the world. <laughs> <laughs> All right, report of officers and managers. Uh, Jim, anything to report? Nope. Jim? Mm -hmm. Nope. Nothing for me. All right. Summary and approval of board direction. Any notes, Chuck? Mr. President, I don't have very much, just a couple, um, that, that may or may not fall within the, the definition. Uh, one is um, the, the manager Anderson referenced the um, work that EOR did for the county and ask that those types of requests come through the district. Uh, second is a, uh, a future agenda item to revisit, I'm not sure if it's to revisit wetland banking opportunities or land conservation opportunities in general. Um, and then the third one is to look at the Rice Creek uh, expense carryover policy as part of the district's uh, policy review coming up. Anybody else? Yes. Okay. All right. I think adjournment is in order. So moved. A second. Okay. Motion to make a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We're adjourned.